who we are and so that that helps. So who are we? Um, welcome to Ivy League Associates. Um, so the full name is Ivy League Associates, but we prefer to be called Ivy League, really. Um, we're a professional finance tuition provider. A bit about us, uh, currently we are located in terms of fiscal location at Yaba in Lagos. Um, uh, we've been in operation since 2012 and we've grown in leaps and bounds. And um, we're proud to say we are the undisputed leader in providing ACC tuition in not just West Africa, but also South Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we've attained the highest rating for a learning provider, and that is the platinum rating since 2017. Um, one of the things we are very proud about is the complement of the tutors we have who teach at the school. Um, a combined lecturing experience of over 300 years um, across the over 40 tutors teaching in the school. And um, even though we say 40 years, um, 300 years, um, in a year we typically run about four diets. So if you take it into context around um, lecturing diets, that's over a thousand lecturing diets within the entirety of the tutors in the school. Um, one of the things we're also proud about is also the complement in terms of the professional background. So um, we, we currently have um, quite a mix of tutors here who also are practitioners in their own right. And that reflects in the way we, we teach. So most of us teach actually what we actually practice um, in our professional field. Um, across the professional services sector, we've got some of our tutors occupying the very leadership positions there. So we are proud to say we have partners, directors, senior managers across most of the professional services firms uh, you can find in the country. And um, in terms of award as well too, so most of our tutors are also recognized um, for the contribution to tuition in Africa and even our students as well. And some of them I'll be bringing them on the call um, shortly to also share their experience with you. Um, we are very, very proud about our tuition methodology and um, is leveraged on three things. So we do extensive planning and that planning also extends to the revision and the class plans that we share in the class. Um, we also have a teaching versus an engaging lecture approach. So we don't just teach and it ends there. We also sort of engage our students as well. So we have a WhatsApp group that is always active. And um, sometimes um, we say the WhatsApp group ends only when the students want it to end. So the interactions are beyond even the classroom. And a lot of people on the call can testify to that. Um, we also have other platforms where engagement still continues. So we, we set assignments on our virtual learning environment and our students can do that and also give us feedback on the go as well. We also have class emails addresses. So most people who have submissions or attempts they make can also send the, the attempt to the class WhatsApp groups. And then finally, the third leg of our tuition methodology is a review and practice phase. Part of which is what we are doing. We we sort of have a session doing the diet where we just focus on question solving. And that's why we also have this sort of situation we have today where we have quite a lot of people outside of this course who joining us. We have a lot of offerings that might suit the complement of what the people on the call might want. So we offer online classes. Um, it could be live classes if you want to join our live classes or access to our recorded classes as well. So we have that offering. Selected papers are currently offered physically. So at Yaba in our facility in Lagos, Nigeria, you can opt to attend sending papers um, physically in the school. Um, at the level of the strategic papers, currently we're offering the strategic business reporting, the advanced financial management papers. They have that variety. It is our hope that in the next coming diet would increase the number of people that can run face to face. By no means um, does this affect the online tuition. So all the classes, all 15 ACCA classes are running online. But in addition to the online class, we also have a fiscal variation. So for example, papers like AFM and SBR also have an online class running at the same time 
there is a face-to-face -face class at our facility in Yaba in Lagos, Nigeria. We also offer um, project mentoring for people who want to obtain the BSc in Oxford Brooks, um, applied accounting. And there are quite a lot of uh, students who have gone on and to obtain a BSc in accounting. We actually feel that um, given the kind of markets we operate in locally here in Nigeria, um, it might also be an advantage for you to also complement your chartered accountancy qualification with a degree in accounting. There are quite a lot of situations we've seen in the past where we see some of our students um, access jobs that they couldn't access because of um, the fact that they needed to obtain a BSc in, in accounting. In addition, last year in 2020, specifically July, we commenced our CFA classes. Um, CFA is a complementary finance qualification um, for the chartered financial analyst. Uh, we currently just rounded up our second diet for that. We'll be commencing our third diet for CFA in July. So we offer CFA classes, uh, level one, level two classes are currently being offered. We also offer for those who want to build their competence on financial reporting, a diploma in international financial reporting standards. So we run that um, if and this can apply to even those coming from a different charter accountancy qualification. You might just want to deepen your understanding on the current uh, international financial reporting standards or maybe you want to have a career in financial reporting. Um, it's a standalone qualification offered by ACC, but we provide the tuition for that and you can get certified in the diploma in IFRS. In addition, we also offer revision and marked mock exams. And, and that's something I'll be sharing with us before the end of today. Um, if you are an external candidate and you want to opt in for a marked exam service, we are happy to provide that to you. Um, we have some of our tutors who can offer that service to you for a fee. You would submit a mock, you get a personalized feedback and it gets graded as well too. And don't forget that quite some of the tutors also mark for ACCA. So that also gives you insights in terms of what an ACC examiner might be looking out for. Uh, next diet or our next ACC run will be as does. Um, on July 10th, we'll be starting our September intensive classes. Uh, and we say intensive because this is typically going to be a two month uh, lecture period just for those. It, we call it like an intensive lecture because we are really going to be fast paced and um, the exams will come in just within two months, the first weekend in September. So if you want to join that, we currently offer that. And for those who would like to do the longer extended version for December exams, our lectures will be starting on July 17th. I spoke about the Oxford Brooks uh, BSc project mentoring. That will be coming up in terms of the next open day to showcase um, the detailed services around what we offer. That will be coming up on August 1st. Above all, our fees are very, very affordable. Very affordable. Mm, if you do that in dollar terms, quite very significant, insignificant in relation to what you find in the market. Um, we are very proud to see one thing that underpins our success is we're open to feedback, constructive feedback. Um, so these are our phone lines. You could reach us on any of these lines and we'll be happy to take your feedbacks. You could also follow us on our social media platforms. Um, we're on Instagram as Ivy League Associates. We're on Facebook and LinkedIn as well to us, Ivy League Associates, on Twitter at Ivy League Profs. Our website is ivyleaguenigeria.com and um, our general email for inquiries is info at ivyleaguenigeria.com. We are happy to hear from you and we hope that um, we're still going to see more of you at Ivy League. So that's it about Ivy League and many thanks for your time. So let's get back to SBO. I want to wrap up. Uh, Thank you, Jojo. All right, that's fine. So let's get back to SBO. So sorry, I have a question. Yeah, please do. Sorry, um, you said something about your mock exams. Uh, for those in Nigeria who are not part of Ivy League, what's the cost? Uh, okay, so uh, let me let's let's talk about that when we get to Q and A. 
Okay, no just problem. so that we just Sorry. wrap up for on time, yeah. Okay, um, let's get to the technical skills. So let's talk about risk. Another area of the syllabus that I personally consider as one of those easy areas because of the applied nature, you would find the questions. So there will be questions around risk. And what do I see? Um, maybe questions that tells you to identify the various risk that the organization is exposed to, or you might have to do an assessment of the risk. In very extreme cases, you might be told to measure. There are quite some quantitative techniques we can use to measure risk. So you might want to look at things like standard deviation, right? That can tell you which measures the deviation from a mean, right? Uh, we can use some of those techniques um, at quite some detailed level. You might do some aspects maybe around expected value, um, might also be used in computing um, certain aspects of risk code, formulas like expected value, variance analysis, uh, variance in itself can also be used for doing some calculations on risk. Um, you also have covariance analysis, you know, et cetera, but quite very basic elementary risk calculations could come up in your exam. I think it shouldn't be far off expected values or standard deviation. Risk monitoring, uh, risk mitigation, very, very popular. Let me leave you with this nugget, right? So what I say to students is take a tabular approach to questions around risk so that you maximize your time um, on exam day. Take a tabular approach so that you maximize your time on exam day. So what I mean by a tabular approach, so you might have to do something like this. You might be told, identify the risk. Um, there might be questions that might say, okay, still explain the risk or what is the impact of the risk? So which can also be the same thing as the explanation of the severity of the risk, what it means to the organization. And then finally, you might be told to come up with mitigants to the risk. I like this approach. I, I think this is a time saver. And this is what I want you to do. Why I like this is that it forces you. I mean, once you understand what the risks are, you know what the impact on the organization is. You can just take it that way. You know what is the impact? Then you know what the impact is. So how does the organization ensure that this doesn't happen again? So I, I, I like that you take this approach, you know, to answering questions around risk. It saves you time and it follows a structured way. Right. So if a question on risk is around 40 marks. So if you do it this way, you might just need to list about seven risk. And then for every risk, you know, you get impact and then there's mitigants to each of the risk. OK, finally, the concept of enterprise risk management is a topical one. And that is really saying that organizations now. Before now, right, and if you think about some of the conversations we had around the risk committee earlier on, um, the views could have been that risk could have been seen to be as some department's duty within the organization. So it's very common to find out that within an organization, there's a risk management team, right? You would even find some organizations have the position of a chief risk officer. And then the team he works with is like the risk team, or if you like to use the word, the risk management team. But what do we see? Because of the severity of risk and the fact that you know, what is even risk in the first place, right? So risk are situations or conditions where there could be variability in the outcomes. So any situation that an organization is faced with where the outcome can vary and the, the, the variation in the outcomes could be could range from positive outcomes to negative outcomes. But where you have situations where there can be variability in the outcomes, then such a situation or such a condition is said to be a risk. So situations where you can have varied outcomes or, or, or varied uh, um, possibilities out of it. So that's what we call a risk, right? And it could be positive, it could be negative. So one of the things that has characterized our understanding about risk before now has been that it, it could have been a departmentally focused thing. But the concept of enterprise risk management is that everyone, right? You, you hear terminologies like you're as good as your weakest link, right? So that sort of typifies what I mean. So everyone within the organization has a responsibility to managing risk. If you also think about it, that the sources of risk in an organization can permeate across the entirety of the organization. So whether it's from the customer facing uh, departments within the organization or it's from the back office, you know, risk 
could be bettered and identified from different aspects of the organization. A growing type of risk we see, thanks to the digitization and the adoption of technology in organizations are technology risk or IT related risk. So there could be risk across every aspect, every transactions, you know, every facet you know, of the organization. So it is everyone's duty. So risk management is a collective approach. The responsibility or in terms of the accountability for risk in every organization is that of the board of directors, which is the highest level of governance. But they can delegate those duties to certain committees, maybe the risk committee, you know, et cetera. But it is everyone's approach. And that's really what an enterprise risk management approach is speaking to, that everyone across the entire organization has some role to play in risk. A good way to look at it right now in most organizations now, you find that organizations keep what you call a risk register. Some might name the term a risk log. And then, you know, across the entire organization, right, there might be some sort of activities that they undertake where everyone is just generally assessing their functions, trying to identify, you know, come up with possible risk. Now, once all that risk has been identified, they become uh, logged in in the risk register. The next thing now is that from that risk register, we then assess. So assessment really is like assigning priorities, right, to determine the severity in terms of the impact of a risk. So we can then do that. So what you finally find, uh, you would see in most organizations is that you might have common classification for risk, maybe high risk, medium risk, or low risk, right? So that guides, you know, the assessment of risk from that perspective. And then after that, then the next thing is now monitoring. By monitoring, I now mean, you know, the response to the risk, right? So if you think about risk management, you know, for the purpose of your exam, you might want to think about it as a four-step process. Let me just say this. If this was to come up in your exam, you might think about this as a four step process. So there is risk identification. Uh, then there's the risk assessment, which I've said, think about it as the prioritizing the risk, assigning which risk are uh, very high and very low right and then the next thing is the risk response to responding to the risk right and you can take advantage of frameworks like the sara some have it as tara i'm going to speak about that very soon right there's also another one called alap as low as reasonably practicable right and then the final one is what i would say as the risk control which is really just repeating this process and monitoring. So this represents, you know, the four stages or the, in a risk management process. So identification of risk is really at the level of every facet of the organization. So every team, every department, right, should be able to identify, you know, certain basic risk that they're exposed to. Then this becomes collated and registered, kept in a risk register log. And then the organization would then determine the parity, right, uh, for those risks, right? Because the reality is that this helps with the response to the risk. We cannot all respond, not all risk comes with the same sort of severity of its impact, right? So even our decision to go online, to offer our classes online, comes with certain risk, right? I'll, I'll be very frank with you. Um, in our migration online, we had people who felt, you know, the technology in terms of the network connectivity might not have been something that they could guarantee in their area. And they said, you know what, maybe we'll wait say when, you know, COVID goes down. So my point is, that is one risk. There's also a risk we could face, uh, which could be that there could also be maybe a government regulation coming to say, don't offer any classes at all again. Uh, in your physical locations. So that is also another risk. So my point is that there will be risk that could be identified across different aspects of an organization, whether it's market risk, whether it's uh, uh, political risk, whether it's uh, liquidity risk, whether it's economic risk, there's all sorts of risk that organizations are exposed to. And this can stem from the various aspects of the organization. Once that risk has been identified, the next thing will be that the organization then prioritizes, which is to assign, you know, um, and broad classification can include things like high, uh, medium, uh, low. I've seen some extreme ones where you can have very high, high, medium, low, very low. I've seen those kind of characterization. And then that then enables us with then how the organization responds to this risk. 
So there are quite a lot of frameworks we could use for responding to risk, right? A very popular one, we we'll call this the SARA framework or the TARA framework. S meaning share and, and T meaning transfer. So there are certain risk, right, that you could decide to share. Uh, and in sharing would be that, you know, you engage maybe a specialist company to also come into it and provide some sort of uh, uh, advice for your guidance in how to go about dealing with it, right? Uh, also, another possible way you can decide to share risk as well to might be to get, you know, more parties involved. So I'll give you a good example. Um, an organization, maybe a, a financial institution might want to finance a transaction. And um, one way they could share the risk might be to say, okay, let's do a syndication of that uh, transaction uh, of that lending. So rather than lending the transaction, uh, lending wholly 100% of the finance required for the transaction, they might decide to say, you know what, let's share this uh, risk because that's a credit risk um, that they are creating. For every time you give out credit, you, you have a credit risk that you're exposed to. So they might decide to say, you know what, let's share this credit risk. Let's also carry out this transaction with someone else. Either they do a syndicated lending or they might decide to say, you know what, and the customer who wants to come with this, can you also have some sort of equity contribution to the financing that you require? So that's an example of uh, when a risk uh, is, is being um, shared. Another approach to responding to a risk could be to avoid the risk totally. There, there are situations where you might want to avoid um, the risk totally. And, and if you think about it, really it's not going into you know, the activity or the transaction, right? And, and the situations where you might want to avoid the risk totally, maybe that's where you think about it in terms of, because we use a metric sometimes for classifying this risk at this assessment stage. So we have what we typically call an impact versus probability matrix. So when you look at the probability of the a risk occurring, and it seems quite pretty high, and the impact of this risk occurring seems pretty high, that might be a flag for an organization to decide to say, you know what, let's avoid, you know, going into it, right? So that might be a response, not necessarily the only response to situations where you have high impact or high probability for the risk, but that can be a response. Because one thing we know is that um, organizations can be structured along the lines of their risk appetite. So we normally say that most profit-seeking organizations um, have a, a risk, um, most profit-seeking organizations are risk seekers. So in terms of the appetite, we say profit-oriented organizations are actually risk seekers. So I'll give you a good example. So if you think about the transactions from a financial institutions that they go into, um, the whole concept around how financial institutions or banks, if you like, you know, generate revenue stem from the fact that they create uh, risk assets, which is loans, they give out loans and, you know, so they might not be one to shy away from risk where the impact or the probability of occurring might be high. All they will just focus on is ensuring that they, they've got mitigants in place to deal with some of these things. So, but I just wanted to know that it's very common that for risks that are designated as high impact, high probability, that those risks um, could be um, one for an avoidance, right? Organizations might want to avoid such transactions that might expose them to that kind of risk. Another response to a risk could be to reduce, um, we call it reduction, right? Which is really to reduce the involvement of the organization in those activities or in those transactions. Um, there are quite a lot of ways organizations can decide to reduce um, their involvement, right? So a, a direct simple way to look at it might be to say to, if it requires some sort of commitment or resources, reduce the commitment or the resources. Right. Another way organizations can tend to reduce um, a certain risk they might be exposed to might be to hedge. Right. So uh, hedging might not offer you 100 percent protection, but it can offer you some considerable level of protection. So, for example, if it's an FS risk, a foreign exchange risk that the organization might be exposed to, they might want to take out, you know, any of the um, external hedging methods we know. Right. Maybe go for an uh, uh, for a, 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 a forward go on the forward transaction or, you know, approach the futures market, you know, or go into a swap transaction, you know, things like that. So you can hedge. Hedging is a, is a valid way to reduce uh, your risk. Even insurance as well, too. You can take out an insurance, uh, uh, um, you can take out an insurance uh, premium or contract on a particular transaction, and that can be one way to reduce it. Um, the insurance company might not be able to totally uh, protect you against all the risk but maybe there might be I'll some. Do. Yeah. So, so I can hear you. Um, this, um, you're yeah, discussing hedging and um, insurance. Is it part of avoiding or 
where can I um, classify this one as? Reduction. I said reduction. I'm speaking on that oh, reduction. Reduction. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Reduction. Okay. But for the rest of the class, confirm you could hear me all along. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Okay, then. All right, so the final, the final risk response, the final, who can tell me what this is, what this speaks to? Accept. accept. All right, cool. So you could also accept it. Now, the rule is, right, um, organizations can decide to accept certain risk, and that is where the impact and the probability from their assessment seems very low. And the guiding principle is risk response right, or if you like to use the word risk mitigation, it's not an exercise that doesn't come at a cost. So the guiding rule is, if the cost of mitigating or responding to the risk will be higher than the benefits that accrues to the organization by hedging or mitigating that risk, then it might just be best to accept it. I'll give you a very good example, right? Um, we can decide to say, uh, that we want to protect all students, all students um, from having any COVID related infection. You know, there is no sort of uh, response that we can come up with that we might say might not be commensurate. But we can decide to say that, you know, if we go or adopt some of the COVID uh, uh, protocols. So for example, you sanitize your hands, you maintain social distance in the class, um, you ensure that we check your um, your temperatures at exit and at entry, you know, you wash your hands, you know, um, we keep the class uh, quite open and allow for cross flow of air. We can do all that, right? Now, in putting up with all of those things, right, doesn't in any way suggest that there might not be a risk that associated with any student coming to the class and you know being infected right you know but we can't say that if we put up all these protocols in place we're happy to say you know whatever is left of it in terms of risk we are fine to accept that as a risk so my point is accepting a risk can be an option where the impact and the probability based on the estimation of the organization might be said to be very low is this clear? Yes, it is. All right. OK, um, there's also T meaning transfer. And quite frankly, when we speak about transfer a lot of the times, um, insurance comes to mind, right? Um, there might be certain transactions, you know, you, you just want to get um, a third party insurance on it, right? Or just get a third party, you could be an insurer or you might want to outsource it to a specialist organization to undertake. So it's quite very common. I, I, I've worked on projects with organizations where they needed a specialist skill set, right? So maybe uh, you might need someone with a skill set around actuaries, right? Or specific valuations or some kind of complex financial instruments. Um, an organization, you know, maybe a, a financial consulting firm can take on that sort of project and say, okay, you know what, let's outsource this job to a specialist who has that competence. And then, you know, that can be a way to transfer a certain risk. So the idea really is that by bringing on a, an outsource party who has this competence, um, we might be able to sort of mitigate the impact on the risk. So that's the other uh, uh, approach around Tara. So some might say transfer, uh, avoid, reduce, accept. Or some might say share, avoid, reduce, accept. Another um, approach to dealing and responding to risk is a, a principle called, you know, and the concept is that business by its very nature is a risk, actually. It's, it, it is practically impossible to run any sort of business you know, devoid of risk. So the thinking around this is that um, we manage risk, not remove risk. So no one is in the business of eliminating risk. 
We are all in the business of managing risk. Now, the point is, at what level can we manage the risk? So then the concept of, you know, we all just have to think of how to bring down the risk as low as reasonably practicable. And once we do that, then we are fine. So one approach that some organizations can take to dealing and responding to risk will just be to come up with mitigants, not totally eliminating the risk, because it might be impossible to eliminate the risk, right? But to bring it to as low as reasonably practicable. So that can be something. So then the ongoing monitoring of all the steps, right? From identification to assessment to responding and mitigating, you know, collectively um, will be dealt with under risk monitoring and risk control. Um, something I know that can be a very popular thing in the exam can be to make a case whether risk management should be outsourced. So you have things like a risk audit, right? Risk audit is part of monitoring and control. So there might be arguments around should the monitoring and if you like use the term control around the risk an organization is exposed to, should it be something that should be internally done or can it be an outsourced function? So risk auditing, um, there could be a question around making a case for getting external people to be involved in auditing your risk, you know, or should it be internally uh, handled? So there are two sides to the coin. Like I say, with an SBL question, there's no perfect right or wrong um, answer. So it's just down to the strength of the points that you make in the exam. Okay, um, let's talk about another area of the syllabus on technology. Very common. You are going to find the technology question. Um, if, if, if your exam will reflect current issues, technology is a current issue in your exam. So what are some of the things I want you to know quite broadly at this level? Because what I see with technology is either you'll be speaking to the benefits that technology will provide for your business, or you'll be speaking with the risk associated with technology, or how technology can support strategy implementation. That's also another thing that can happen how technology can support the implementation of a strategy, which also links to the benefits. So you would find out that the points are generally similar. So if I asked all of you on the call now to tell me what are some of the benefits of any kind of technology, let's say what are the benefits of cloud technology, what are the benefits of robotics? Let me just hear some people share their views with me. I just want to let you know that they are quite similar in approach. So what are the benefits that technology provides to a business? Who is happy to have a go? Better access to customers. I didn't. I didn't hear you. Go on. Uh, wider access mm. to customers. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, a good example is the kind of call we are having now. Um, if we're not leveraging on technology, it would have been difficult to have people from South Africa, Mauritius, Zambia, Malawi. You know, just join us on the call. All right. So that's cool. Then it makes reporting. To be seamless you can have your reports online so reporting. online so so the big picture is online reporting online analytics so you can do your decision your analysis you know real time online on the go all right cool i think it Sorry. helps backups For cloud technology so i guess that can help the organization to access its information anywhere all right so the same thing right um 24 7 that's really the bigger picture that 24 7 um you're always connected right so you can always access your information and then work is not limited to a time zone now it's not limited to a certain operating hour so you, you find people even people that live from any aspect in the world you know their work right so 24 7 right that's really what it supports that organizations can function on a 24 7 basis and when i say 24 7 24 hours a day seven days a week all right so i just wanted you to know that the benefits are really there to tell. Even let's talk about risk. So, what are some of the risks associated with technology? Cybercrime, data right. security, data downtime. security, okay. downtime kind of call. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Oops, right. uh, also, loss loss of data can happen as well too. Loss of data and then third party access to data. Really, yeah, third party unauthorized access to data. Virus. Also virus yeah the whole thing around malware etc can happen brilliant I, I mean i love the responses from the class right so i want you to know that technology both from the perspective of the benefit or the risk are things you can identify and 
That is how the questions are going to be set. So what I want you to do for me on the exam day is that I want you to pay attention to some of the pain points. I use the term pain points. Or if you like, what are some of the issues that the organization will be facing? Then you now interpret it to say, how can technology alleviate those issues? So maybe the time it takes, we spoke about real time access, real time analysis. So maybe the question might be highlighting. So my point is that the benefit and the risk are not things you cannot speak on, but the value is that you should be able to speak on the specific issues affecting the organization. So don't give a general benefit, don't give a general risk. Make sure that you understand the pain points in the exam, you understand the issues in the exam, and then your benefits or your risk, depending on the questions, how it's being worded, is addressing the pain points or the issues in the exam. That is where the marks come from. So that's just really what I wanted to highlight, that you all know what the benefits are, you all know what the risks are, but they must be situated to the conversation, which is the question on exam day. So cloud and mobile technology, some of you understood it, which is really the concept. So I'll start with mobile technology, uh, which is leveraging mobile devices. So which is the fact that mobile devices now, you know, that computing does not have to be limited to remotely fixed devices. So for example, if you think about the use of your mobile phones, that is driving mobile technology. If you think about uh, your mobile tablets, that is driving or running on mobile technology. Now, that also side by side is the fact that data in itself is now becoming mobile. So why is data mobile? There are organizations that provide data subscription or data management services on a subscription basis. So you can approach those organizations to store your data. They can manage your data for you. They have capacity to store as much data that your organization uh, can process, and then they sub charge you uh, for a fee. So it's like a subscription based model. So the good thing with this is that if you think about most organizations, especially at the growing stage, startups or small and medium organizations, part of the things that would help them scale and grow is the ability to manage the operational cost. A huge component before the advent or before the rise of cloud technology, a huge component of their operating cost used to be technology related cost. I'll give you a good example. My earlier career was in technology. So we, you would have situations where you would have to make investment in servers. You have to make investment in an IT room. All complicating it as well too is the best practices around you know this um, technology management. You might need to have a, a, a hot site, a, a cold site, which we call in technology a failover site, right? So you don't find in most organizations just having one data room. The best practice is that there will be a failover data room, which is should there be any issue, should there be a disaster, you can recover and continue your operations from another data room or from another computer room or another server room. So if you think about this cost, it's quite a very significant cost for a lot of organizations. But with the presence and the growth in cloud technologies, you can now allow third party companies bear this cost for you at a fraction of a fee you would have incurred. So if you look at Microsoft, Microsoft has Microsoft 365. You don't need to make any significant investment. It's a cloud subscription, and then based on the number of users, you make those payments. Almost all softwares used by organizations now, you now have a cloud subscription approach. You have a cloud service, a web service, you just subscribe to it, and then somewhere in some part of the world, far away, maybe in one continent, maybe in America, right, is a company as big as maybe a Microsoft or an Oracle, a Google, that's is offering you that cloud subscription services. So do you see lots of benefits for the organizations? Who see lots of benefits for organizations by adopting cloud and mobile technology? If you see one, can you tell me? Who is happy to tell me a benefit with this cloud and mobile technology? I, I didn't hear you. Yeah, go on. Reduce costs. Oh, Okay, what does that mean? Like, explain it. Oh, okay. So basically, it, rather than uh, incurring the cost of um, purchasing the um, the uh, hardware installation and uh, basically monitoring, you can basically pay an IT company and get services for 
I, I, I get uh, quality services from them. So definitely it's be at a reduced cost as compared to having your own um, software or structure. So definitely the, the, the definitely cost for you to get the same quality of value. All right. So that's a very good point. Okay. Who is happy to talk to us on a risk associated with some of these things I just explained around cloud computing, just in case it comes up in your exam? Well, okay, um, um, I think that's our loss. Say that again. I didn't hear you. That's our loss. Okay, okay, yeah. All right. I also heard someone, a lady was trying to speak. Uh, uh, yeah. Let me hear from her. A lady was trying to speak. Yes, I was going to talk about, well, similar, sort of like data security because you're not in control of your yeah, third party. data anymore, third party interaction. All right, okay, that's very good. All right, cool. Um, the next part of your syllabus is on big data and an, another examiner's favorite, right? And there are quite a lot of past questions on big data. So what is the gist I want you to take out of big data and data analytics? And um, so one is the reality that we are in today, which is the fact that the kind of data that we are exposed to now um, has quite some varied uh, unique characteristics. And I'll call them the V's of big data. So there are five of them. It, it, Traditionally, it used to be three. Well, please know for the purpose of your exam that there are five Vs, right? In case you just say a question that speaks on it, right? There are five Vs, right? So what are they? The volume, which speaks to the huge nature or the voluminous nature of this data that I'm speaking to. So for example, if I asked you, do you know how much data a company like Facebook acquires on a daily basis. Do you want to think about how many people are posting on the Facebook platform? Extend that to their other pseudo platforms like WhatsApp, like Instagram. Do you know how many people are logging in on those platforms concurrently, posting updates, you know, you know, just loading data on their platform? So one thing we see about the kind of data we're exposed to, and if an organization really is interested in acquiring data, so maybe, for example, an organization wants to engage with their customers. You decide to say, I want to open up uh, a presence on social media. I want to have uh, 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 um, a social media account on Facebook, on Instagram, on WhatsApp, on all these social media applications. And then you make a deliberate effort to be very engaging on those platforms. You don't want to know the potential amount of data you can generate on a daily basis. And this data, right? So one is that it's quite voluminous. So what you can generate now, because we're in a data explosion era. Everybody, I, I, can, as, I can promise you that as we're on the call, a lot of people are using their mobile phones. A lot of people are using their laptops. They're also creating data in other platforms. So that's the kind of data organizations are dealing with voluminous data. Another thing is that the speed in which this data is coming is very alarming. And that's what velocity speaks to. So at your fingertip, you can, data can be generated. In fact, now you can, the, the, the whole concept of a single sign-on, quite a lot of platforms can allow for integration. So you can sign in, so potentially if you sign in on a Google, uh, which you're on, on your, on, on a Google account, on any device, potentially that can also allow you sign in almost immediately to all the pseudo Google services from Google Drive to any Google, to YouTube, to any Google related application. So if you think about it in terms of data generation, not now in terms of the volume, but the speed, how quickly are we generating data is almost at an alarming rate. One of the things I used to share in my class is this one second, there'll be one minute on the internet. If I ask the class, do you have an idea on how many videos are being uploaded on YouTube every minute? How many likes are being uh, given on a post on Instagram every minute, you know? So data is also being created at an incredible speed. And that's something that typifies big data. Another thing about big data is the concept of the varied form you can find this data. And I call this variety. So data now is not restricted to how we used to have it in the past, maybe in text form or in pictures. Data can, in fact, you, you have all sorts of file formats for data. All sorts of file formats. Data can be stored in emoji 
forms, can be stored in pictures, can even even have uh, uh, sensors that can read, you know, um, human movements, human movements, right? So, uh, and there is a duplicity and multiplicity in the forms in which data can be stored in. So that's another thing that typifies this. Another thing about big data is what I'll call veracity, is that uh, the data should meet a veracity test, is that big data must be truthful. And what I say about truthful data is really two things, all right? One is that you should be circumspect with data you generate externally, especially from social media. So I'm saying that it is not big data if it's untruthful data. So be circumspect with all the data you're generating. So for example, a thousand likes are coming on your page. So on your social media channels, you're getting a thousand likes. Be circumspect, right? Some of those things could be robots, uh, robots at play. You know, some of those things could be a spam or, or, a vir or a virus infection. So don't interpret that to be data. So the fact that we are speaking about voluminous data or data created at an alarming speed doesn't mean that the data is the truthful data. So you have to be circumspect. Right. And if you can instill mechanisms and that's why you find that on some platforms, if you want to sign into some platforms, you might do like a humanity test. They will ask you, can you recognize some symbols? Because they are even very intelligent animals that create accounts. Right. Aside robots creating accounts and, you know, playing around with technology, there are instances. Right. I've seen a video on intelligent animals like dogs actually creating accounts and playing around. So the, 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 which links to the last V around big data, which is on value. Right, that at the end of the day, big data is the, the investment in big data is to generate value for the organization, and value can either be cost reduction or revenue generation, right? So it must be linked to these two. We don't make all that investments or bother about generating data or gathering data if the organization is not thinking about how to create value from the data, right? So um, that's something I want to say be circumspect with data you get from social media. And then the other aspect of veracity is continually refresh your data. How can this be tested in your exam? Maybe you might be told to prepare a PowerPoint presentation justifying the investment. So maybe you're an external consultant or you're a new CEO and then prepare a report to the board. Maybe the audit report does seem or a risk or control deficiency that has been identified in the report says that um, there are quite a lot of manual processes in the organization. Or you might read a report, you might be, you might have been engaged to say that um, a director has brought up the issue about the benefits that technology is providing for a computer. Prepare a PowerPoint presentation justifying why an organization should make investments in big data and what are the associated risks with it. So I just want you to know that some of all these points I've made here can be very useful in that kind of response, right? So why big data? What are the things to look out for in an investment in big data and uh, analytics? You want to pay attention to some of these things, right? So uh, back to veracity, second spec to social media, and also finally is that you should continually refresh your data. Refresh your data. And um, when I say refresh your data, is to go back. So I know for the banks, um, one of the regulations guiding the banks is that you must constantly know your customer. And you know your customer means that periodically you go back, ask your customer, have you changed your house uh, address? Have you changed your business location? Have you changed your email address? Have you, because all that can feed into some sort of customer analytics, right? Uh, maybe a new product wants to be done, uh, new channels, a brand wants, a bank wants to open a customer, a new customer um, location uh, to serve a customer, maybe a new branch. They're looking out for where to do it. They do the analysis. 80% of my customers operate within a certain uh, geographical location, maybe in the north. Then they say, okay, maybe it's time to take our presence closer to these customers. So you continually have to refresh your data. So that's it about the characteristics of big data, and that's the kind of data that organizations are exposed to. But let's answer the question on value. So what sort of opportunities do big data present for organizations? So organizations can create new products as a result of the analysis of the big data. There are quite sophisticated analytics that can be done. In fact, we had a guest session on analytics by someone from KPMG in, um, in one of our sessions. And he gave us real industry insights as to how firms are optimizing the data that they are storing, right? So whether they are doing predictive analytics, right? Or whether they are doing prescriptive analytic or diagnostic 
uh, analytics. You know, you can sort of understand your customers better when you understand the data that you hold. So potentially data is gold mine actually, you know, and it is gold mine when you can commercialize the insights you are getting from the data. So maybe it's time to have new products based on your customer purchasing power, or you might be involved in a product and then the research just tells you that the product that you sell that is generating significant amount of your revenues actually feeds into another product. So potentially, by looking at the data you have about a demand for a product, that might somehow be creating a need to introduce a new product. You know, so um, I, I want you to know that the benefits with holding the data is, is not in itself that you're capturing the data, but it's the insights you can distill from the data, and more importantly, how you can now commercialize that insights that you get from the data. All right, so that's it. Um, so it's a very popular exam question you might find. Um, e-business yeah so broadly under a business um something a model that i hope you know in the class there's a model called the six eyes of e-business right and that is really speaking to what are some of the unique peculiarities that firms that operate on the internet or conduct their processes over the internet what are some of those unique um characteristics opportunities that are available to them. So I, I, I want a smart student to just tell me, let's go through the six eyes of e-business. Who is happy to, to, to Inter take the interaction. lead? Interaction. Okay. All right, go on, go on, it's fine. I just want to write it down. Individualization. Yeah, also have intelligence. All right, okay. Independence of location. Yeah, then independence of location. All right, so Corrective. Interactivity. Uh, inter integration. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Integration. The industry structure also counts. Yeah, industry structure good. Independence of location. Yes, I've said that. Yeah, two more. Individualization. Yeah, individualization, like and which is customization intelligence. and intelligence. All right. Yeah. So I think you should know some of these models for your exam. We call them the six eyes. You should know some of it. If there's any point around e-business, something again about e-business is um, quite some related topics that have been tested in the past. The question of smartware, it was there. Um, so things like a customer database management system. Uh, E-marketing has been tested in the past. Uh, in one of the past questions, I've seen e-procurement. Right, so I, I just want you to look at some of these things. The final one is on IT system security and control. I think we've said a lot about uh, IT system security and control. Um, quite very common. It came out in the highlight question. Um, if you called the highlight question something on IT security and control. This is highlights. Uh, let me look for that question on security and control. Yeah, so you see something like this. The finance director has asked you to prepare three presentation slide, one for each risk identified. Assessing the potential outcomes of each of the IT risk. Right. And if you wanted to see some of the risk, it's you will find them in the exhibits. Let me go there. All right, yeah. So these were some of them. And this was tested in this diet. So you would see some of the IT risk, lack of focus on an IT strategy, uh, lack of leadership, um, data breaches, uh, business continuity threats. Okay. Some common IT risk you can find. Some of you spoke about things like viruses, right? Uh, network attacks. 
there's what we call a denial of service as well too. It's also a network attack. A denial of service as well can happen. Um, but are there ways organizations can beat some of this uh, IT risk or manage them? So yes, they can at different levels. You can. Um, antivirus at your individual pieces can help. Um, you can have firewalls. Firewalls um, also help to prevent unauthorized access to your system. There can even be fiscal restriction to the IT systems and Sorry, the IT. What did you write after network attack? Say that, say that again. What did you write after network attack? Denial of service. That's an IT risk. I'm just listing certain kind of risk we've seen. So that's what we call denial of service, right? So there are some, um, it, it's still linked to um, attack, um, IT risk, or if you like to use the term, some hacks into a network. So we have it, it's called a DOS. So an organization can experience a DOS, which is they're trying to access some of the applications they cannot. So, and it's really when they are exposed to some IT um, risk, you know, so there might be programs that might deny them the ability to access a particular service at that time. So some of all these uh, infestations and viruses, you know, can prevent authorized people from accessing um, authorized applications. It's called a DOS, a denial of service. It happens at a network level. It's just to take some of the network protocols on the network down, and then you'll be trying to access something. You just find out that in the organization, you can't access a particular application, right? So hackers, uh, certain kind of programs might be stopping that program from running. It's called a denial of service. Is that fine? Yeah. Thank you. All right, cool. OK, um, let me go to another aspect of the syllabus, organizational control and audit. And what I'll say to this is that this also is related to, I, I want you to take the same approach um, with this, with that of risk, which is really, I like that you answer questions on control because the questions will really be around identifying a control deficiency Right, so you would have to identify the control deficiency or the lapses, the lapses in the control, and then you will suggest the mitigants to those lapses, how to prevent those lapses. So I, I please do this for your exam. It, you, it will really save you time and it's really very effective, right? So once you know what the issue is, how do you prevent the issue? I like you, you use a tab tabular format for responding to the control issues. Okay, um, in terms of um, what other things I think you should know about um, internal controls, um, nobody's going to be asking you what are the objectives of internal controls, right, um, within the organization, but some of the objectives you should know around internal controls is to safeguard you know, the assets uh, in the organization is to ensure regulatory compliance, you know, is to ensure that um, there's compliance, you know, with the policies of the organization. But what I want you to know is that you must be able to identify where there is a breakdown or where an internal control are not effective. Instances where the, the, there are lapses in controls, right? Um, in class, when we did the September 2018 question on COFO co construction, a lot of us could easily identify them. One thing I, I, I mean, I want you to think about with internal controls is, in fact, what are internal controls, right? So internal controls are activities that are put in place by the management to ensure that the objective of the organizations are met. So simple things like ensuring that, you know, um, there must be an authorization for every spend that happens in the organization. That's an internal control. Ensuring that, you know, uh, uh, um, any requisition that the organization will be making should be countersigned or should be linked to a budget. Those are examples of internal controls. Uh, uh, that people are supposed to be at work at a certain period and they come to work. So, for example, a control might be to say you log in the time in which you come in or the system captures the time in which you come in. So you enter your biometrics and a system captures the time that you 
come in. So any sort of activity that an organization institutionalizes to ensure that the objective of the organization is broadly met, then those are control activities. So you should be able to identify where there are gaps or lapses in internal controls in an organization. So the second part of this syllabus is around the audits. And in an SBL exam, our focus is on internal audits, not external audits. So under audits, um, we've spoken about some of the functions of the audit committee, some of the clear things you should find in an audit committee. So some of them range from things like the membership of the audit committee has to be wholly non-executive directors. Um, at least at the very least, right, um, the chair of the audit committee must have a very solid financial background, right? So that's something again. Also, the chair of the audit committee should not also be the chair of the overall organization. That doesn't help as well too. So uh, the, sh the sh chair of the audit committee can also be the chair of the board, right? And then um, we have what we describe as the model of all controls or the control of controls, if you like, is internal audit. So internal audit is one mechanism that we put in place which is to ensure that the internal controls in an organization are efficient and are effective. The internal audit function can be undertaken by the staff within the organization, or it can be externally sourced. So an external party can be providing the internal audit function. And all they do is just to ensure that the controls are effective, you know, and to test for the efficiency and effectiveness of the controls in an organization and then report on it. Um, the head of the internal audit department, which is normally called the chief internal auditor, has a dotted reporting line. And I use the term dotted reporting line to the chief executive. And that is just by way of administration oversight, right? But the head of the internal audit reports just the same way the audit, uh, external auditors, you know, uh, report their findings to the audit committee. The head of the internal audit has a direct reporting line, a clear reporting line to the audit committee. Right, and these are means by which we want to preserve the independence, right, uh, of that function. Okay. A very important aspect of the SBL syllabus is on finance, and um, I, I think most of you will be at home with questions on finance, but I'm, I'm just going to speak on some of the new issues in finance that I think I want you to note. And um, so you should be able to link it, right? One thing we say is that you you cannot devoid uh, or, or, or separate right um, strategy from finance because strategy that organizations do set can be implemented based on the financial resources that have been devoted to it right so that's something i want to see um, also the function the finance function in an organization has moved has changed um, historically finance functions uh, were very transactional in nature so things like processing payments, you know, following up with vendor payments, uh, you know, following up on receivables. But what we see right now is that some of the finance functions now can, can be a mix of the following. So some finance functions can be centrally coordinated. So you'll find that some organizations run a group structure and when they run a group structure, their finance team or their finance function is centralized rather than decentralized, which is each subsidiary of the organization have its separate dedicated finance team. So some of these organizations run a centralized finance function. Another thing that I would say that is changing also in the finance function as well too is a rise in a lot of automation of some of the finance function. So I'll give you a good example, right? Um, years ago, you know, when I started out, right, I started in banking, you, there was considerable amount of effort spent in doing bulk payments, bulk salary processing, right? So those things were quite very routine. And, and, and aside the fact that they were routine, there was not a lot of value we're adding. There's an account to debit, there's an account to credit. So you had those sort of transactions. But now there's a rise in automated tools that can drive bulk payments, right? So you can process large tickets of transactions, right? Using automated tools. So one of the things that we clearly experience a change in the finance function is the automation of certain fu functions. And the sort of functions that qualify for this automation are functions that are very routine and very transactional. So I know a lot of organizations, right? Uh, I, I know for very big organizations, multinationals, they've all been transforming their finance teams. 
and it, at the heart of the finance transformation, what they are really doing is to break the functions or the activities that the finance teams are doing, separate them into those that are very transactional and then those that are around analytics and value addition. So for those transaction ones, what they are doing is either they are outsourcing them or if they are not outsourcing them, they are leveraging platforms, automations, where those things can be manually automated. Now, the bigger picture with the automation is that you clearly then shift you know, uh, uh, the resources that you are spending on those functions and put them to more forward thinking uh, or forward stated um, transactions, right? So that's something we see in terms of the transformation of the finance function. But what underpins or what drives this transformation of the finance function is really the role of technology in finance. So technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, things like that are really transforming um, the, the, the finance function and, and just allowing for manual repetitions uh, routine transactions to be done and leveraged on technology platforms. So is this clear, right, in terms of the transformation in, of the finance function? Yes. All right, cool. Um, you, you, financial analysis, you, you, you might do, make them in your exam. I'm going to talk about sources of finance and uh, I want to highlight a new addition to the syllabus. Investment appraisal is also something. So you might do an MPV computation. It might just be a simple accounting rate of return computation, which is the same as the return on investment calculation. Um, or uh, there are some questions where we can do a payback period computation. Decision trees have not been tested, but it might be, I mean, there's a technical article on this I can share with you. Um, decision trees is just a diagrammatic way of representing a, 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 a decision an organization wants to make and the various courses of actions it can take. So the various paths it can take to arriving at a decision, just represent it diagrammatically and then you a tree. So a tree meaning that there's a root and then the branches represent the various approaches or actions you can take. OK, um, financial performance analysis can be tested in your exam. And this is really around ratios. So you might do some ratio analysis, whether it's liquidity, gearing, profitability. It might come up in your exam. Um, yeah, decision making short term, maybe you might I haven't seen, but I think, OK, there was a question in Dochico, something about contribution. Yeah, there's a question on contribution per product, something like that. If we can see Dochico, yeah, there's a question like that on decision making. Yeah, short term decision making. Uh, cost and management accounting, you can stretch this to budgeting as well. So you might see a question on budgeting. Let me show you the Dochico question, just so you see what I mean around that. Let me look for Dochico. Can you see my slide, guys? Yes. All right. OK. Yes. yes. So I'm just looking for the question. So this was the question I spoke about developing strategy. It was a systemic question, but 20 if you add the professional skills. The question was, yeah, recommend with justification, yeah, how to prioritize and order. Uh, yeah. So I, I just want to see whether the data that was used. So in doing the prioritization, you had that you needed to compute the contribution. But yeah, this was it. So this was the question I was referring to. So where we are looking at the contribution per uh, each of the options. So you might want to look at Dutch again. This was September, December 2019. You might want to look at Dochico. That's the question, yeah. Okay, let's go back and talk about um, Okay, yeah, variance analysis will stem from budgeting. Uh, the difference between the actual and the budget is the variance. Yeah, and then all that, so that's fine. Okay, let's go to the last part of the syllabus which is on 
innovation, change sorry, management. Sorry, sorry, Jonathan. When you talk about um, um, sources of finance, ICO, I, I don't think you talked about it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for. I, I, I'm just under a lot of pressure to move and conclude this, right? But let me touch on it because, I mean, it could come up in your exam. Thanks for bringing me to that. All right. Okay. So let's go there and talk about ICOs. All right, let's talk about ICOs. Okay, um, so ICOs means initial coin offering, but I'm going to tell you how this is linked to the syllables. So traditionally, when we speak about the sources of finance for an organization, uh, it was from broadly two perspectives. So if you think about the dichotomy, if I asked you, to the lady who asked me that question, if you wanted to raise finance, what were the I mean, what sort of options will come to your mind? How do you raise finance? Oh. Um, equity or debt. Brilliant, exactly. So the traditional dichotomy has been, you know, you go with equity, you raise equity or you raise debt, right? Equity referring to investments, right? Uh, which also leads to a share in exchange for ownership in your business. Or debt, which is really borrowings, or if you like to use the term loans borrowings or loans, right? And then, well, this is investment in return for ownership. All right, but innovative models now in raising finance, right? And this is quite very common. Now it's very common, is the issuance of cryptocurrency coins, right? Um, and, and that's why we call them coin offerings. Initial coin offerings is synonymous with what you have with public offerings, right? Which is when you are raising debt for the first time, right? So. Uh, maybe the broader term is by issuing a coin, right? But because you first of all have to do it, so the initial time we refer to the initial coin offering. So a third option, which you can suggest, and, and this is how to think about it for the purpose of the exam. One way organizations can raise finance is to issue cryptocurrency coins. Good. So a third option, and it's a very valid way to get good marks in your exam. Might be to suggest that the organization should issue a cryptocurrency coin. So I'm going to come here and say a coin offering. So this is a new way of raising finance. Now, what are the specifics? So that if you have a question that says, prepare a presentation to the board, highlighting the benefits of coin offerings as a means or as a source of raising finance. So I will speak to the peculiarities about this so that you can interpret it and internalize it in a question around how to raise finance. So you might see a six mark question on what available options. Maybe their debt, their jaring levels are, are very high. Maybe the organization has tried to pitch to investors and they've not been able to get any sort of uh, uh, headway on that. Another option can be to issue cryptocurrency coins. So what is the difference? In a cryptocurrency coin offering, it is a coin that is being offered. So I will say a cryptocurrency coin is being offered. So the investors are investing not in the company, but in the coin. So really is a bet against the movement in the store or in the value of the coin. A good example of this has happened with Facebook. So if you want to update your learning, you might want to check the Libra coin, right? So Facebook has issued one. There are quite a lot. Tesla is working on one, right? Um, what's his name? Elon Musk already. So that is one way you can do it. Now, so what happens here is that investors are investing in the coin and not the company. So I want to be, I want us to be clear. So the investments or when they raise the funding, there is no impact that that has. The only impact it has on the company is that when they issue the coin, then the cash proceeds that they get by issuing the coin, the company can apply it. But let me be clear that the investment is on the coin. So it's really betting against the movement in the coin. Now, the organization then has to ensure that that coin grows in value. So what are some of the ways the coin grows in value? The way the coin can grow in value is any of these two either they sort of develop their own internal ecosystem 
So make sure that the coin, because what really drives valuation, if you look at, you know, equities and look at financial securities, what drives valuation is really the law of demand and supply. So if they want to improve the value of this coin, what they try to do is to make sure that there's improved the demand for the coin. So one way to improve the demand for the coin is to create alternative use for the coin. So one of the things you will find out is that for most organizations, I mean, you can see that with what Elon Musk is trying to do that with this coin. So one of the things they do is that you can now facilitate payment. So you can use that coin as a medium of payment. So today you don't have to just typically use your traditional currency to pay for a transaction on Facebook or for WhatsApp or on Instagram simply by using your dollar card or by using your credit card. If you have access to the Libra coin, you can use that to make a payment. So they are facilitating an ecosystem where you can use that coin to drive payments. So that is one. Now, but much more as well too, is that obviously the value of the coin will be linked to the value of the organization. So for as long as the organization, because the organization will be promoting the usage of this coin. So for as long as the organization in itself is also growing and meeting its expansion targets and objective, that would also affect the, 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 the value of the coin. So it is it, it hedges the organization against some of the risk associated with debt and with equity. What are some of the risks associated with equity and how that is absent? So for example, with equity is really you offering a stake or an ownership in your business. So dilution of control is a risk that you find with uh, an equity insurance. So with a cryptocurrency coin, you are preserving that. Facebook and Zuckerberg has preserved their control in the company because they issued, they used the coin to raise finance rather than, you know, issuing uh, shares in the company. So you can preserve control, right? Also too, right, if you think about it, um, it, it, it the most popular companies I find that use cryptocurrency coins to raise finance are tech companies. You can stretch it to also say, you know, startups with lots of potentials. So most times, if you think about it, right, companies that issue cryptocurrency coins to raise finance really speaks to high growth potential companies. Because if you think about this, nobody goes into those sort of investments for the long term. You can read what's going on with Bitcoin, right? And see the way the value in Bitcoin has significantly dropped. So most people who go into this sort of investment hold is, have a short, -term, uh, 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 a short term horizon as they go into this. So one of the things that it really does address really is it reflects, you know, the market acceptance of the understanding of the value that your firm can create. So you can preserve your control startup firms tech especially high growth and and this has to be clear right high growth firms can also you know deal away with the issues around uh, 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 financing through equity or debt by issuing out cryptocurrency coins so it's it's an evolving means a lot of companies are taking advantage of this and um, it's something that you can recommend in your exam in terms of risk, what are the risks? Maybe that might be something I should just tell you. What are the risks with the issuance of this cryptocurrency coin? So the first one is regulation. So you don't find a lot of acceptance of um, cryptocurrencies, right? Um, in fact, it's outlawed in certain geographical areas, right? It's outlawed, uh, which means that it's, it's, uh, it's not an approved means of making payments or facilitating transactions, right? So there's no global regulation around it. So that's one. I know in America, uh, it varies from state to state. Each state is at liberty as to what to do, right? There are also strong evidences, right? And, 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 and the research is there if you want to do some more after the class, as to how um, cryptocurrency is also linked to things around terrorist financing. So which really speaks to the under regulation, right? So it doesn't have a proper regulatory framework. It is uh, doesn't have a proper visibility. Then there's also the aspect about um, consumer protection. So for example, who do you report? Um, uh, 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 I mean, who do you take to the ombudsman? Like who do you report to? Uh, who sort of mediates in, 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 uh, incidences of fraud or uh, consumer rights issues where you go into a cryptocurrency transaction and it goes very bad. Who, who's really responsible for that? Right? 
Another thing I would say again, uh, in terms of risk, is that for the organizations and for jurisdictions where they issue cryptocurrency coins, um, before you issue a coin, you would first have to do what they call a white paper. So you issue a white paper. The white paper really is the value proposition and how the coin will be ethical in its usage, how the coin will create value, how the coin will not be used for all these terrorist financing, you know, things like that. So that white paper will be issued and it might go through lots of back and forth before you start mining your own coin. So at a broad level, really, the problem with cryptocurrency is really down to transparency in the way no one, right? No one can really say to a large extent um, how transparent all the transactions that are going through, uh, you know, uh, um, transactions associated with these coins, how transparent they are. Um, there's also not a proper visibility. You can even extend that to things around, you know, taxing that aspect of uh, the economy as well too, right? Uh, you might ask, say that they are not even captured, so they don't even contribute um, to the growth of um, the global economy. So those arguments are there. Um, so that's it. Is that fine to the lady who wanted to know about coin offerings? Is that fine? Yes, thank you. Fine. All right. Okay. Um, let us get to the final aspect of the course, which is on innovation, change management, and performance excellence. All right. So the first thing is um, organizing for success, which is organizational structure. Uh, I want you to know that traditional organizational structures, which have been things like divisional structure, functional structure, are making way for new sort of business structures or business models. So sort of the new evolving structures you can find in your exam now can be things like, you know, virtual structures, right? So you might find organizations that just operate as a virtual business. So you have things like virtual structures, right? Or you have things like strategic partnership. So people can decide to partner and this partnership drives things like around outsourcing as well. So I want you to know that you might be put, there was a question that was that was I don't know who can remind me. Is that March 2020 or July? It was a transformation exercise that was happening. I think that was March. I want you to know that you might be an external consultant on the exam day coming up with uh, tools on how to restructure a particular organization. So I just know that there are evolving structures that are betting. Um, the core really is that an organization does not have to fully have, you know, the capacity to provide all aspects of its operation, you know, using their own resource. So you can leverage on outsourcing, you can leverage on offshoring, you can leverage on strategic partnership, right? There are quite a lot of structures again, you know, things like holo structure, you know, you can you you have lots of structures, but but what they speak to is outsourcing or going into strategic partnerships. Disruptive technologies have been tested. It came out in the highlight question. There's something on disruptive technologies. What are disruptive technologies? Nobody will ask you that, but just so you know, if you wanted to recommend one, so these are technologies that will that have the capacity to replace the business model that you currently find. So these are these are technologies that have altered, shaped, replaced the status quo, right? They've disrupted the status quo and replaced the status quo with a new business model. Um, very popular one that can make sense is when you think about what Uber has done with um, taxi and, you know, taxi ride services. So we call them, you know, hill riding services, right? And to hill a ride, right? So you can do such things. You also think about in hospitality, what Airbnb has done. You think about fintechs what fintechs are doing in the financial services, you know. Um, you can also think broadly around how mobile applications, so the use of mobile apps, um, almost everything can be done with mobile apps. In fact, a lot of organizations do loyalty schemes for people who go through the mobile apps. So if you even wanted to get um, some reduced um, uh, uh, um, or 
get some savings in some of the things you might want to purchase. It might be best that you even take advantage of the mobile apps of the organizations, right? So you find this sort of disruptive technologies, you might be told to recommend one. The clearest question that tested disruptive technology was in December 2018. That was on Highlight Co. Right? They tested disruptive technology. Uh, it was called Rent a Room, which is similar to what we do with Airbnb. So just so that you know that uh, it's been tested in the past, is a disruptive technology, um, and it can be tested in your exam. So these are technologies that have the capabilities to disrupt the status quo and replace it. So look at it here. The chief business analyst has asked you to write a report for the next board meeting, which discusses the potential challenges to highlight posed by the development of the disruptive technologies, which I imagine in the hotel industry and highlights the application of disruptive technologies that may be considered. So um, you might see an exam question, the particular industry might identify that there are disruptive technologies. It does vary from industry to industry um, and, and be able to respond to it. So what defines a disruptive technology is that they replace the status quo, right? And replacing it means that they alter what has been happening there and now replace it with a newer way, right? So a lot of startups are disrupting uh, industries as, that have been traditionally known to have been very, very um, dominant. So there's a bet on banking, right, as to if some fintechs will disrupt banking and replace traditional banks as we have it. What I can tell you, I've been in a lot of research, is that the banks are also trying to respond by owning their own fintechs, having their own fintechs, right? But fundamentally, the jury is still out as to if banks would still be existing in some future time to come, right? So in the next five or 10 years, will fintechs not totally eradicate the needs to have traditional banks as you have it? But I just want you to know that disruptive technologies are in every sector, every industry, and just replacing the status quo you'll find in that industry. Even in education, there are quite a lot of disruptors. So we that's the term we call disruptive technology, disruptors. So uh, organizations providing these services are called disruptors. And so there are quite a lot of disruptors we see. Even in, so you have a lot of ed tech firms, ed meaning education technology firms, um, where you can you know consume. I mean, you see what Udemy is doing with um, some of the programs. So in bite sizes, right? You want to do a program in Udemy, just a small course. You pay for as little as ten dollars, twenty dollars. You get a certification or something, right? And you find out that is out, right? So th those are really disruptors you know, or, or disruptive technologies at play. So I just want you to know that in your exam, there might be an application of a disruptive technology and, and it's your duty to highlight one if you see one. Okay, um, talent management, which is around HR, and that's quite straightforward, uh, that people are quite very relevant to an organization and that you're only as good as the quality of people you have. And I think that's quite very evident in the class. Right. Um, so organizations have to make a conscious effort to developing their people. And this development and this talent management range can, is multi uh, uh, faceted. So some might take the route of um, trainings. Some might take the route of succession planning, empowering their team members. You know, so there are various methods organizations can take towards empowering people. Right. And, and but it, it starts with the premise that um, the most critical asset in every organization is, is the people. So that's really what I would say on that. Performance excellence um, speaks to why some um, teams excel, some organizations excel. And one of the things um, that we can use to analyze or take a view to performance excellence is the Badridge assessment criteria. I did tell you that there is a particular technical article on Badridge assessments, right? Uh, I can share that with you guys just immediately after the class, right? And But let me ask you guys, right? So there are about seven components in the Badridge assessment criteria. Is anybody happy to share with us? You want to raise your hand and just speak to us. It came up. Let me show you, just so you know. It has been tested in September. Dorchiko. I'm going to show you Badridge assessments. Yeah. So you would, so these are aspects of it. But before I get to showing you, so look at it. The directors use the Badridge model as a framework to assess Dutch's approach to performance excellence. So this has been tested in the past. This is it. 
But let me hear from some of you who is happy to talk to us on the aspects of the Badij model. Yes. Who's, who's going? Leadership. leadership. All right, so leadership. Let's go, let's go. Let's make this a quick exercise. Strategic planning. Strategy. Go on. Customer focus. Yeah, come on. Uh, and there's measurement, analysis, and knowledge management. Yeah, measurement, analysis. Workforce, workforce focus, that's people. Yeah. Um, operations. And yeah, then operations. Results. Yeah, operations. And then the results. Result. All right. So there's the latest technical article on this. I, I think you should read it. If you want to see the way it has been tested in the past, you want to check September 2019, Dochiko, and you would see it, right? This was the question on the bad huge assessment. So I, I, I think we shouldn't take this for granted. All right, let me go to another aspect of the syllabus, and that Hi. is... Sorry, Mr. Jojo. Yes, ma'am. Um, please, can you relate um, this performance excellence to um, a public sector um, scenario, how it could be tested? Okay. I have a guest coming in in five minutes' time, but it's okay. I mean, uh, I'll, we'll stop whenever he comes in. Okay. So, the thing is, the concept of performance excellence, so, so I'll explain that to you. I mean, I got your question, but let me explain. The concept of performance excellence is to really understand why some teams outperform their competitors. And we nailed it down to those seven things, which um, we shared in the former slide, right? So they are very good at their strategic planning and their strategic execution. They have a strong focus on their customers, right? They also have a strong focus on their employees and their workforce. Um, they are very good in their performance measurement, so they have tools for performance measurement, for analysis, and also for knowledge management. Something we also know about these firms is that, um, so they're also focused on the operations and their processes, so operational processes, operational efficiency through their processes. There's a sixth aspect I've not covered. Um, that is around leadership leadership yeah leadership. so sound leadership ethical leadership and then this translates to the results so if you wanted to apply this to any organization be it um public sector or private sector the thing is to find out is there a presence this seventh one is the outcome so you can't do anything about this you can't find is there a presence of good results so if these six first six are ticked and they are in order it will translate to seven so this result is the excellence excellent results so more like saying that excellent result is a product of some work and what is the input that goes into excellent results good strategic planning and execution strong emphasis on the customer deep understanding of what makes your workforce productive and how to apply that in terms of motivating your workforce very good performance measurement systems and good performance analysis and good man knowledge management systems you know very operationally efficient processes and then sound ethical leadership so if you wanted to apply this to any sort of organization the starting point and that was the way it was applied in the budget question in that dochiko is to find out how the organization is faring along the six if you find out how the organization is faring along the six then you see the gaps so the point is, if you plug in the gaps, then it will, once you plug in the gaps to be able to make you tick the boxes right for all these six, it will translate into good results. So how do you apply it to a public sector firm? Find out what are the current gaps in terms of their strategic planning versus where they should be. What are the gaps in terms of how they relate and manage their customers? So currently, where are they versus where should they be? So then you will find the gaps, and then the next thing is to ensure that the organization can close out the gaps. In closing out the gaps, there might be certain recommendations or certain things they need to implement. So once they implement those gaps, then it translates into the final result, which is excellent results. Is that, is that fine? Do you understand this, Mal? 
Yeah, I do. Thank you. All right. OK, cool. OK, um, yes, yes. Yes, go on. This is Louis. Oh, OK, Louis. Oh, yeah. you see, I told you I had um, a guest. OK, so Louis, just give me five minutes so I introduce you properly. So just give me five minutes. I assure you by four, you'll be out of the call. Is that fine? Yes, yes. That's fine. Right. Thank you, Jojo. OK, so the last aspect, um, which I can link all of them together, so from change, you know, uh, to project, is that the business environment, like we saw when we looked at strategy around the key drivers of change, is not a static one, right? And it's quite a very fluid environment. So whether it's from a regulatory standpoint, from a technological standpoint, economic standpoint, there are quite lots of avenues that might be, you know, that might create scenarios or rooms for changes to happen. And those changes can be felt in their, an organization in several ways. So one of such capabilities that organizations must build is the ability to be able to manage these changes. Right. There are some changes that can be dealt with at a very operational level. So I, I, I will call that improvement programs. Right. Some changes can be done at a very uh, tactical level. Right. But how do you deal with very strategic changes? Right. So I'll give you a good example of a strategic change. A major and an acquisition. So an organization wants to go into a major arrangement and by going into that major arrangement, obviously to catapult them, you know, in terms of their strategic direction, maybe they will become closer to achieving their strategic uh, objectives. So how do we manage strategic changes within organizations? So one way we manage this is to introduce this change in a systematical manner. And that's where projects come in handy. So projects are systematic steps in which organizations can translate strategic changes into day to day operations. So think about this. An organization wants to be the market leader across the region in Africa. So that might mean that they might get into some projects, some acquisitions might be happening. There might be some acquisitions of a software. There might be some measures acquisition. You know, there might just be a combination of certain programs. You know, there might be a mass acquisition of new talents, you know, new people to come in to join the workforce. So the point is, if organizations must deal with strategic changes, one capabilities they must really strengthen is on project management because that's a means by which they can manage change and deal with change, especially for very uh, mega strategic changes within the organization. So what should you know in your exam about project management? You should know that there are five stages or that the project life cycle is made up of about five stages. Who is happy to tell me what the five stages are? We have planning. Ah, because you heard me say that since. Okay. No. <laughs> Initiation. Identification. All right, let's go. Initiation, project initiation. All right, project planning. What's project the third planning. one? Planning. Project, project execution. execution. All right. Monitoring. Thank you. Project monitoring. And completion of the all right, and the final one is project completion. If you like, say project closure. OK. Um, there's a lot of article I can share with you on this. Guys, I want to stop now. I don't have so much time. I felt that if I had to do anything for you guys today, I could come in and start with a question. But I wanted to really build and refresh your understanding on the core areas in SBL. And then that takes you forward to the exam. So the next phase of today's session will be in two parts, right? It will be around exam techniques. And then the final part will be Q&A, which is anything you want to know about SBO. While the second part will be on exam techniques. So we are going now to the exam technique section. So we're going to go into a series of conversations now with certain people, and I want you to take advantage of this. So I'm going to be calling forward people who have excelled, and these are ACC award winners in their own right, all of them, who've excelled in this paper. I always tell my students, I didn't write, I mean, I wrote this exam about 2012 or so, about 
nine years ago. And he wasn't called SBL. He was called P3 then, right? So I always like that people who went through the experience, who sat under those conditions, you know, and excelled will come and share their experience with the class. So I'm going to be bringing three of such people forward to the class, right? And they will share their experience with you. They will tell you some of the things that will define you doing well in your SBL exam. And one thing I will tell you, I've not heard the three of them speak today, but I will tell you that if you pay attention, you will find common themes across the three of them. So presenting to you guys, uh, the very first person on the call today is a guy who excelled very well in our September exam, one of the ACCA prize winners in the September 2020 exam. His name is Lewis. Uh, Lewis, is a privilege to have you again on the call. So I would like you to speak to them. They are writing their exam in three weeks' time, which is one of the things we did uh, differently this time around. So the whole idea is when you share your perspectives with them, a lot of the things they will hear from you, they will start applying it so that by three weeks' time, they will be able to say, we are confident we are going to do justice to this exam. So, Louis, the floor is yours. You might want to make it five minutes so that you can take some questions. I know you have a meeting by four. I apologize for this. So, the floor is yours, Louis. Thank you, Jojo. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, thanks again, Jojo, for having me. And I'm happy to be here. Um, I'll just say three, um, three things. Um, firstly, really, everything Jojo has told you, please do not discount any of them. Um, so first thing I'm going to say is um, the EPSM module, if you haven't done it or, or if you have done it, um, it's really helpful. Um, if you still have time, um, I'm going to, to recommend it. Secondly is around the technical articles. Um, those are very valuable um, because you have, for this paper, you need to be able to generate a lot of quality points and initiatives and ideas around how you're going to respond to the examiner. So those technical articles are like gold mine. Um, you're going to get a lot of, a, a lot of points from, from um, there. Um, now, um, overlaying all of this, um, assuming you, you have studied the, the materials, you have attended a, 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 a revision class like um, today, um, you have finished the EPSM mod, um, module, you have read the technical articles. Uh, I think the really this um, biggest part of it all um, really is the mock exams. Um, aside from any mock exam you might have done maybe during the lectures, you, you need to do mock exams on your own. Um, um, and I recommend up to minimum of like eight mock exams on your own. It's, um, really, I always say this, two, two, two things it's going to do for you really it's not really about um to um for the exam it's really to help you first to know how you are good on timing because the exam is very time is is time based and you are going to have to generate ideas under time con conditions right so the mock exams you're going to do on your own is going to test those skills for you um so you know which lapses you have and you know where to to um, work on. Another thing again that the mock exam is going to do for you is really about the ideas. You really need to be able to generate those ideas, the quality ideas that the examiner needs to, to see in your papers. Um, I think those those are really the three things I'd like to state today. And this is really my this was my strategy across um all the papers I wrote in ACC and I think they're very um, useful. So um I'll open the floor for questions now, um, so I don't speak too much. All right, um, brilliantly said, you captured three things. You spoke on the students paying attention to the EPSM module. I said that to them when we started. You spoke about the role of the mock exams, very, very helpful, and you spoke about the technical articles. Okay, um, guys, uh, I, I don't know if somebody heard him mention eight mocks. I'm going to talk about that in my parting shot today. But if you have a question, um, signify by raising your hand um, so that we, we coordinate this. He doesn't have a lot of time, so just signify you raise your hand and you want to ask him a question. That's fine. OK. 
Okay. Do I take it that there's no question? If there is no question, Sorry, so what then, was your mark? No, 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 no. I, I, I don't want to be asking that sort of question. That puts pressure on a lot of people. Uh, okay. I've been doing this for a while. I don't like people asking people their scores. Honestly, it might just throw some people up. But if you if you think you want to know, you can share with you. But I don't think the focus should be on what his score was. Or I don't know. Do you want to know that? Okay, Fola, your hand is up. Yeah. You know the old syllabus where you have the before this thing one that you have the EPM module that you pay one another. So if you have done before that one, well, uh, you are writing as well now. Do you see how to you know you are not mandatory to go and to do the yes yes new, yes yes yeah. yes. Um, so what I would suggest to you is, um, you might want to, so there are two approaches. Maybe you want to pay for it. If you think you want to, you don't have to for the purpose of your membership conversion, but maybe you, if you have a friend, you might want to go through it with a friend who has paid for it. Maybe that's the direct response I might tell you. The other option is if you want to pay for it. Okay. Yeah, Tony, your hand is up. Are they Tony? Yes, good afternoon, and thank you so much. Um, I just want to um, hear from him um, how you actually gathered your time in studying for SBL because um, SBL is one of the um, one of the papers I'm finding difficult to pass. I'm always within the range of forty. Five and forty, and trust me, I've done everything. So I was just wondering if you have tips or not to actually uh, make it through this June. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, Louis, the floor is yours. But, but something I want to say to you, Louis, just so that you put it into perspective, is all exams are going to be computer based. Okay. So you might want to just modify some of the things you might say within the context of your paper based. So all exams will be computer based. So go on, the floor is yours now. Okay, okay excellent. Thank you, Tony. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so firstly, I don't know um, how your journey has been, um, but for me, firstly, I attended classes and I was yeah. very active during classes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't re recall missing any of my classes. Um, I think those are very found, foundational for me. Um, but really, like to fast track to the exam day, um, I think prior to the exam day, the, the AMOC exams have actually put me in a very good spot um, in terms of understanding the concepts, the, all the middle con concepts in, in the paper, and uh, most importantly, to be able to flesh in them up or to know where they are more appropriate when, when I see a certain question. Um, but on the exam day, um, really, um, assuming I mean you've done some mock exams, you know how to read the S B L question, you know how to skim through, you know how to map your thoughts together. I think those are very important, and these are some of the skills I'm going to recommend you you um, learn during the mock ex exam examination that you are going to do by by yourself. Um, you don't have to start with question one. Um, you can start with your strong spots, um, but I think those are really not the core. The core is really before the exam, you've had time to practice some of the most important skills, which really is to be able to generate the ideas and fleshing them up. And I think the mock exams that you're going to do on your own on that time con con addition is very valuable. Um, really, that's really one of the core um, success factors for me, uh, because even when I got to the exam hall, um, I was able to easily flow with the paper. Um, I was able to read the um, questions. I had the added uh, techniques to read the um, questions to know how to put my thoughts to, together and, and um, be able to also, also manage my, my timing in the process. Right. And I, and I recall I 
I didn't expend all of my time. I, I, I finished roughly 35 minutes um, early, right? So, but it was a mock exam that really put me in a, in a good spot. Um, I was able to practice a lot and that made me understand all, all of the concepts and be able to apply them in, in any of, of, this, of these um, scenarios that, that, that I find in, in the exam. Um, so yeah, I hope that was a bit helpful. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and just to add that um, Sotoin really is really around um, focusing on mocks. And um, because really, when I hear you say your scores were closer to the borderline, it, it's not uh, a reflection of knowledge. It's just exam techniques. So what I'll say to you is you just prioritize, you know, doing lots of mock. Did you hear the number of mock he did before his exam? Um, he said it, right? So I'm going to speak to that before we end the session on the role that mock plays in this exam, right? Um, what are we happy to offer you? Um, for a paid service, you can get the feedback on the mock. So if that will help you, right? But if you want to self-mark yourself, that's also a very good discipline uh, approach you can take. Okay, um, Lewis, do you want to squeeze in one more question or you, you are fine to go? Which of the two? Because I still see a hand up. Yes, I can squeeze in one more question. All right. Thank you, JJ. All right. Ikena, your hand is up. Okay. Thank you very much, Lewis. Uh, thank you very much, Jojo. Please, I, I, I just want to say something with regards to your last comment that you finished your exam within 35 minutes. You see, these questions, no. uh, the questions sometimes, even when I've tried in my own practice. It can, I'm feel, so sorry. It can, uh, I 35 minutes earlier. So, that, yeah, 35 minutes earlier, sorry. Like, when you are producing your responses, how did you know that what you are writing was even sufficient for the marks available? You know, that, that is, it comes very tricky where you're trying to squeeze in so much into the time available. So that's my question. Okay, thanks, Ikena. There's there's a technique that um, that I learned during uh, my stay at Ivy League. Um, firstly, for any question, there are marks, and also you have a rough idea of how many quality points that you you need to build up to um, achieve those maximum marks. Um, yeah. So before we even start putting pen to paper, right? Um, it's I was able that you outline the major ideas that you're going to be talking about before you start building up uh, because um, if you don't do that there's a chance that as you start writing you might not be able to recall some of the key quality points that you might want to talk about so that technique really was helpful during all of my exams so um to the, the point is so i know the number of, of of marks the maximum marks to a question i outline the major points and really everything I'm saying might sound easy. I I've, I've, I had to master all of these um, techniques during the mock examination, right? So even before, even while I was doing my my uh, my mock, I would outline the points I want to to discuss, then I will now flesh in it, right? So I know that that way there are high chances that I'm I'm going going to touch on the most key things that the examiner wants to see in the in, in the report. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, and just to add, um, I, I've not touched on the exam techniques. I'm going to give you a structure that would guide you as well in, in that sort of point you just made. So I'm going to cover that in my next session with you. Um, Louis, I've got a hand again for you. I don't know. I, I, I want to respect your timing. So let the call be yours, to be honest. I've got a okay, hand. I'll be out, that's fine. I'll be out by four. Zero five. So I, I have just two minutes. I've, uh, I can take right. the last All question. Right. Tandy, you can go on. Tandy, go on. And that will be the final, the final question because we still have more people on the call who wants. Okay, Tandy, I wanted to know how would you go about planning your answers in the exam, and how much time would you spend doing that? Okay, so I guess when. When we get to the exam technique session for for um, today, you are going to know that for each of the questions, there are 
recommended amount of minutes that you are going to um you're supposed to to um, spend so that you don't kill your chances of attempting another question so normally you're supposed to um, spread the number of marks by the total number of minutes in the exam and that'll give you like a guidance to um how, how much time you're supposed to spend on the question so knowing that we also try to determine so the number of points you need to quickly raise and how long you need to fleshing up those points right but these techniques really you are going to master them with a the mock examination because that way you know that for every question or every question there are marks and there is in, there's a maximum recommended number of minutes you're supposed to spend on that question right um but that's really that's the way it's it sort of flows okay thank you you're welcome all, all thank right you, yeah so lewis i just want to express our gratitude for your time uh, many thanks for your time and um, we know we can always count on you in this subsequent class thank you so much Jojo. take care all bye, right. bye all right thanks okay um so guys that was um one of our standout um students in a previous diet um he did so well was recognized by the acca and um we're proud right uh of our students and and if you remember the slide i showed you up about ivy league we've we produce award-winning tutors actually um the best SBL tutor award currently is for a tutor in Ivy League and also the best SBL student performance in the country is also for me past students at Ivy League. So we have both the tutor and the students award for this particular paper in Ivy League. And, and let me just brag a bit, right? Um, so at Ivy League, we've produced twice, right, over my time in Ivy League. Two diets where we've had 100%. And let me tell you what I mean by 100%. Every single student who attended the SBL exam that was an Ivy League candidate passed the exam. So we've done that twice. Um, we've always done things, are, I mean, the last exam was 72%, right? So we've hovered around 70 to 80, but we've done 100% twice. And, and, and it's not an impossible thing that we might do 100% again. So I just want us to achieve that collectively. Okay, so I've got two more of them to come. Um, I don't know if Okpe is on the call or if Maurice is on the call. I guess they will be joining anytime soon. So if they are not yet on the... Hi, Jojo. This is... Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. 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 Yeah. Okay. So I've got the second of them on the call. His name is Okpe. Yeah, Okpe Mikpo. Sorry. Um, so... Why I like Okpe's story is um, Okpe attended a, an intensive diet with us. So because our programs are structured around a standard diet and an intensive diet, Okpe attended an intensive diet with us and he did exceedingly very well, right? Um, I, I also think that that also shows um, in terms of the diversity of our students and, you know, why the regardless of the format or the products we offer, there's a consistent thing around um, how they approach the exams and that translates to success. I think Okwe did the March 2020 SBL, one of the standard students in that particular yes. paper. Yeah, brilliant. So Okwe, I mean, the floor is yours. Um, they've got three weeks to the exam, so you might want to speak to them. What are some of the things that worked for you? Um, what should they be thinking okay. about? And um, you make room for questions as well too. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jojo, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, I'm happy, happy to be here. Um, so I'll just be um, brief about it, really. Um, so I'll just speak about the things I did, um, you know, when I had like two to three weeks um, before the exam, and then I'll just, you know, talk about some resources I think will be very relevant to, you know, um, you guys, essentially, and then just talk about some, um, or just debunk some myths, essentially. Um, so first, so what did I do, you know, two to three weeks before the exam? First of all, um, you know, I mean, I'm someone who likes to finish um, my study packs, right? So from top to bottom, essentially. And so I, um, 
any topic or concept I do not understand. Um, I try to, you know, solidify my understanding of them, you know, the first week um, or the first week in the two to three weeks before my exam, essentially. So what I do is um, I read, I try to reread the topics or the concepts, and then after doing that, you know, trying to solve, you know, questions that are specific to those topics or concepts. So if you have the revision kit, you would see that, you know, there's an index that, um, sort of splits the questions across topics. So for concepts or topics I found difficult, I try to you know solidify my understanding of them by just going through them again and then also solving questions specific to those topics essentially. So that's what I did for the first week of you know the two to three weeks before my exam essentially or three weeks before my exam. Um, so for the second week and you know the first half of the third week, um, like Louis said, you know I tried to solve you know a lot of more questions. I think I did about five or six. Um, Jojo gave us a task you know, to finish, like to solve all the three specimen questions at least. And, you know, I tried to also do some extra ones, some of the past papers essentially. And, you know, just like we said, what, you know, the mock exams do for you is that they help you, you know, give you a sense of what the exam would look like, right? So, you know, and not just solving the mock questions, right? Solving them under timed conditions. That, that's exactly. very, very important. Exactly. So that, you know, you you, are, you already know what you are, you are meant to do before you even enter the exam in terms of structuring your answers, approaching the requirements and all of that stuff. And, you know, like Jojo would also, you know, speak to later today, the techniques. I mean, there are some specific techniques that will help you, you know, analyze the requirements for each particular, you know, question, right? So that you don't miss out because there are some requirements that carry like two questions in one. So, I mean, if you do not analyze them properly, you, you might miss out on answering everything or just answering the right things, essentially. Um, so I believe that you'll speak to that. So I think the the um, the technique basically, you know, splits um, the requirements into like different parts. So helping you to identify the format of the question or whatever format um, you're meant to answer with, essentially. So if it's a report or a letter, I mean, what exactly you are meant to do right and then it also like helps you identify the number of marks how many how much how much minutes or how many minutes you have to you know allocate to each of all these requirements essentially but i believe that you know judo will speak extensively to that you know um, later today and then also um what else did i do so for the second half of the um last week before my exam right i mean i i, I tried for most of my exams or all of my exams i just tried to you know try to remove myself from you know the whole exam tension right so i try to rest you know do some other things essentially and then also just focus on the technical articles right so just try to you know read the technical articles because there are some topics that you know in the study parts they might not have you know talked about extensively for example internet of things or you know some of all these new technologies essentially but you get a lot of insights from technical articles which will help you like Louis said generate ideas when you're solving the questions or if you see any question related to those particular topics essentially um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that, that sort of concludes the first part of, you know, my talk. And then I'll just speak to some, you know, general advice and some resources I think, you know, will be very helpful to you as you prepare for the exam. Um, I think one resource that helped me really was the examiner's report, right? So after solving, um, you know, a particular mock exam, right? If the examiner's report is available for that particular mock exam, I try to read through you know, the report to just see um, how the examiner wants me to answer the question, right? Like, what does the examiner really want from me in terms of answering the question? Did I answer the questions in line with what they expected or was I off the beat, essentially? Right, so that's what the examiner's report does for you. Um, and then also there's a um, there's a, um, a document that speaks to the key verbs, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it explains like what the verbs mean right so if you see explain if you, if you see discuss if you see demonstrate or something like it explains to you what you're meant to do when you see those verbs um and so i think you know reading that particular document is also very very essential i don't know if you just share that with you or if you will share that to you know, later today but i mean i think it's, it's important to get your hands on those document or that on that particular document rather and then also um there's another one um i can't remember now sorry let me just look at my notes uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to remember later on, but yeah, those are like the two major ones. And then if I remember the last one, I would, I would speak to it. Um, and then also on a final note, um, if you can get, you know, a study partner, I mean, I think, I think you, yeah. I mean, it worked for me, right? So what, what Juju did for us at, you know, that particular point in time when we were writing ours was that he, you know, assigned us to like other students in the class. So he paid us essentially, right? And you know, what that helped me to do was, you know, Again, it helped me solidify an understanding of the concept because when I, whenever I discuss with my partner, I mean, 
you know, she explained, you know, her understanding of different topics. I also explained mine and, you know, by rubbing minds together, you know, it helps me generate, you know, ideas or see things from a different perspective that I wouldn't have even thought of, you know, for some particular topics or concepts. So that really helps me, you know, in the exam. And it also just helps you, you know, I mean, you have someone that you can easily share your frustrations with essentially, I mean, like someone who would understand. And it just helps you, you know, um, in, in different ramifications, essentially, right? So if you can get, you know, a study partner, a study body, I think you know, that'll be very, very helpful. Um, I'm trying to remember the um, document that speaks to the different verbs, you know. Um, ah, gosh, gosh. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, that's fine. I yeah. Well, yeah, then, yeah. Sorry, just just the last thing before I before I close. Um, just to debunk a myth, right? So, you know, I think there are, there are frameworks, right? That you know you would see across you know, different topics as you read your study pack, study pack, right? Um, and then most people believe that if you don't know these frameworks, I mean, it's been very difficult for you to, you know, I mean, answer the question in the exam. But I, I think that is a myth, right? Or models essentially, right? Because there are times where, I mean, like under examination conditions, you might forget some of these frameworks. But I mean, that doesn't mean you cannot answer the questions, right? You can answer the questions based on the merit of those questions, essentially, right? What that means is, I mean, like Louis said, it's all about generating ideas, right? So. You don't necessarily have to follow a particular model before you can generate ideas for to a particular question, a particular requirement, essentially. So do not be, do not fret or do not be scared if you do not remember a particular model. Just try to understand what the requirement is about. And like Judy would always say, add value, essentially. Just add value to whatever requirements, you know, whatever answer you're putting down in the um, exam, essentially. And then also remember this breath over depth, right? So, I mean, that's one thing the um, mock exams helped me realize. So I spent a lot of time answering you know, a particular question and, you know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't have had enough time to, you know, finish all of the questions or at least touch all of the questions, right, which wasn't, you know, good enough. So, I mean, with the mock exams, I was able to, you know, find a way to ensure that I was able to touch all of the questions without, you know, missing out on anything, essentially. And like Louis said, you know, um, with the techniques that Jojo will share with you, you know, he will sort of show you how to allocate, you know, time to, you know, the different marks that are available for each requirements in such a way that you'll be able to touch all of the you know, questions and not miss out on anything. Like they say, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, essentially. So, yeah, I guess that would be it from me. And I'll just pause here to take questions if there are any. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Um, fantastic, right? It's always good to hear this sort of um, feedback, you know, um, after you've gone through this process. So, um, guys, you, you, you have him. We also have another person after him as well, too. But so, I mean, he, he shared his perspective. Um, there might be specific issues and I really just want you to feel very free. So if you've got questions you want to ask him, please, I mean, the floor is yours it's, and you can ask the questions, right? So if you've got questions, yeah. please feel free. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Before we go into the Q&A session, I just remember the last document I was you know, trying to remember essentially, and it speaks to the different formats um, yeah. for each. Yeah, so if you know they ask you to write a letter, what are you supposed to what, how does it how is it supposed to look like, right? How should it look like in terms of you know the format? If you're asked to write a report, I mean, how should you structure the report essentially? So there's a document that just shows the different formats for the different types of um, reports you're meant to write. So I think you know it's essential for you to you know just go through those other particular documents and ensure that you have a full picture of what you're meant to do when you see, you know, or when your the requirement asks you to write a letter or a report and all that stuff, because you get marks for all of all those things, I mean, and you know, as it's important to amass as many marks as you can, no matter how cheap they are, essentially. So yeah, I just thought to also add that. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. All right, so it's question time, guys. Let's uh, take advantage of their timing and ask them questions. Okay, so if I don't have a question, then I'm happy to ask one. All right. Okay, okay so I've got Fumi, Ulua Fumike. Yeah, you can speak. Hello, please, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so 
Um, I know ours would be the first CB, if I'm not mistaken, but um, going through the study path, I see emphasis on annotation that's giving short notes to maybe when reviewing exhibits. How can, does this really help? And um, how can we do this? I'm not sure if this would um, go with the way Okwer did his exam, but um, I don't know how this helps with the exam and how can this be done with now the current CB. Thank you. Okay. Um, in fairness, to Okwer, let me just speak to it. And, but if he wants to share any perspective, that's also fine. So can you see my screen? Let me ask you, can you see my screen? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so um, I, I deliberately put up the CB platform um, just so that we see some of these things. Fundamentally, nothing will change. Um, I can say to you that I've been reliably informed that you will be given a plain sheet if you want to put some thoughts together on the paper. That is one. Secondly, one of the things I found out as I go through questions with the students, I mean, doing our Ivy League sessions, uh, that I, I actually think is even quite faster now that it's computer based. So I'm going to give you a practical example, right? So for example, um, this is a word processor that you're going to use, right? This is a word processor that we're going to use. Um, so ideally would have been annotating on something. So I come in and maybe I go to maybe a particular exhibit. So maybe I take on article on charity leadership. Um, sorry. You could copy whatever you want to do. Control C and you come and you paste. So that sort of helps you in the, your response option. So that sort of helps you with, you know, some of the information that you ideally would have wanted to annotate on. So I can copy it here and then begin to sieve out the important things that you need. So that is one option. Another option is that there's a scratch pad where you can put up all your thoughts and you would see that I have some things still there. That's because whatever you put on the scratch pad on the response sheet is permanently stored, right? It has to take me to delete it. So this was a question I did in the class and that's why you can see all this on my scratch pad, right? So you can copy stuff and paste them. So the scratch pad too is also like a replica of like maybe a scratch sheet you might want to use. So you can sort of think about it as replacing the physical writing you would have done on your question paper on the scratch pad, or you can do that directly on your response sheet. So that also helps, right, in terms of putting your thoughts together. If there's something you see you like, you copy it and you paste it on the response sheet. So that might help you with addressing that. Also, there will be a plain sheet if you really want to take a pen and buy and actually put down some thoughts. All right, so that, that, that's my response to you. Does that help? I don't know. Thank you. OK, uh, do I have a question again? Do I have specific question? Do I have a question again? OK, um, so okay, let me ask you a question while some of them are still thinking. So um, OK, yeah, so I know you spoke about frameworks and, and I know you meant models. So yeah, how was it for you? Did you, were there some models you, you sort of crammed before the exam hall or you just approached the exam as it didn't fit? So what was it like for you? Um, so for me, I tried to um, store in my head as many models as I could. But like I said, um, you know, when it gets into the exam hall, I mean, sometimes it can be a different ball game, right? So when you're under, a lot of pressure in my tend to forget them of all these things right so for the ones i could remember um i just like you said approach the question as i deemed fit um and just like you'd always say add value essentially i mean um for you to be writing a cca there's some level of um you know smartness that you must have attended let me use that word right so i mean like you should be able to i mean add some value to you know whatever questions you're asked essentially right and not i mean if you don't remember the models it's fine I mean, do not panic, do not fret. I mean, just like I said, understand the requirement. Okay, so what are they asking me to do, right? And, and just think through it. And I'm sure you'll be able to come up with a few ideas, a few points that will earn you some marks, essentially. 
So for me, um, I tried to start as many as I could in my head, but you know, when I got to the example, there were some questions that required me to apply some models which I couldn't remember. I mean, I just, you know, attack the question as I as I didn't fit. And yeah, that was it essentially. So I mean, not being able to remember the models in the exam or doesn't mean you would not pass the exam. Yeah, I mean, sure, I think sure. I recall That's... I recall there was someone you also invited during that time to speak to us, and he said he didn't even like store any model in his head. <laughs> he just went to the exam hall and just you know attacked the questions and and he passed essentially. So so yeah, you can pass without storing any models yeah, or cramming any models essentially. So yeah. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. OK, so Hillary has a question for you. Hillary, you can unmute and speak. Oh, wait, me just a simple question. Do you do your own e EPSM? I want to know. OK, no, I didn't do, I didn't do EPSM and I've not done it until now. <laughs> I need to do it to convert my affiliate status to membership status. But yeah, I, I didn't do it before, the, before any of my um, professional exams. Yeah. OK, so um, Hillary. Don't get too excited. Let me say something before you get too excited. <laughs> yeah. My data said, and you know, I, I indemnified myself. I said 75% of people who pass these exams have written it. So that supposes that there's a 25%, right? So where might have been in the 25%? So my question to you is, where do you want to be in the 75%? Or do you want to be like Okwe and be in the 25%? Where do you think the space can accommodate you? In the seventy five percent or in the twenty five percent? That's my question for you, Hilary. Since it's just twenty hours, I'm very sure there's enough time to do it. Yeah, you should, you should if you have the time. Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, I can't thank you enough. I know this was a short notice, and I know you're always happy to do this. Um, we are so grateful. Um, and um, I hope that by the next time we call you, I'll be talking to an ACC member <laughs> so that they don't uh, have to so you've not done your EPSM. <laughs> so I, I want to say many thanks for your yeah. time. And, um, yeah, you're welcome. Always happy to see it. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. All the best, guys. Yeah, cheers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Right. OK, so I told you I had three of them, so we've heard from two. So the next one is also very exciting, and um, I'm sure you all will be excited to also hear from the next um, person as well too. Um, so let me confess to all of you publicly. In all the, how many people are there, right? I think nine plus five. Yeah, so my time was nine plus five, that was 14. In all my 14 papers in ACC, I didn't cross up to 90. But the next person I want to call on to speak to you guys had 90 in an SBL exam. Um, I've had a student in the past, uh, that was the prize winner. She had 91, right? And then this is the second person I've also met as well to, in my course of teaching who had a 90. A 90 in an SBL is no mean feat, right? There's a lot of work that's gone into it because people largely refer to SBL as a very narrative paper, right? So if someone has done 90, and I, I want to put this out because someone asked about the score for Lewis, right? So I, I, I think that I, this sort of person exemplifies anything I want to find out. So I want to call someone who did exceedingly very well. Um, in 19 and SBL is by no means an easy fit. That's a lot of hard work, preparation, you know, doggedness that went into his preparation, right? Um, we're so proud about him as a school because it's one of those testimony cases we use, you know. He's moved on, he's gone to his CFA program with us. So he's one of our CFA students. He's even passed, um, it was our, our novel, um, inaugural CFA sets, he's also passed the CFA exam and is moving on to the higher levels within his CFA program, right? So that sort of typifies what we're trying to do as a school, just really progressing our students, you know, along the way. So the next person on the call is Maurice. Um, so Maurice, welcome to Ivy League once again. Uh, you're always at home when you're here with us. And um, the students have got to write SBL in three weeks' time. They've heard from two other standout people. Um, but I think that you would also bring a lot of value to the table. So um, they've got this exam in three weeks' time, right? I, I just want you to tell them what they need to be doing right now with three weeks to the exam so that they could also turn up and have a 90 just like you did in your exam. So Maurice, the floor is yours.
Maurice, the floor is yours. You're not on mute. You're on mute. I mean, you might need to unmute yourself. Yeah, oh, am I the only one who can't hear him, or is that a crossboard? The crossboard. Yeah, it's a question. Okay, Maurice, we can't hear you. I don't know. Do you want to? Can anyone hear me? It's better now. Just, just, it's better now. Just increase the volume. Okay. So, is it fine now? Yes, yes, that's that's better. Hello. That's fine. I can hear you. That's fine. Is it fine? It's still breaking. No. Oh, okay. Uh, go for me. Okay, so I said I'm not okay. Let me just leave the room. Uh, see if 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 that would be better. Are you there? Or maybe we should give him some time. Okay. Let me give him some time. I think um, sometimes that's the issue with these things. The network can never be too... I also had my first share when the class started. So let me give him some time. Maurice, whenever you are back, um, just let me know and um let me have your attention okay so guys let's go into um exam technique let me speak about this till morris is back so now we've gone through the syllabus technical content we've covered it um, I'm going to share with you some documents again that can help you. There's a document I like, and I, 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 can, I can recommend it for you at this stage of your revision. It's called 100 Things About SBO. It's a very short document that just tells you key things to focus, and, and it does it in a way it's called 100 Things to Focus on Before Your Exam. So that's, that's just for anybody who wants to still build on, on some of the technical knowledge. But I think you're now fine to then jump into exam practice and mock practice right so let me tell you something that you should and you will hear that from all the speakers who would have spoken to you so the first thing is this exam sits across quite a broad range of technical and professional skills so the very first thing is to start testing your understanding and mastery of these things 
And it's not something that will happen overnight, right? So there's a lot of practice. And as you do the practice, you would find progression in the practice. So one of the things I'm going to say to you is that there has to be a lot of emphasis on mock questions. I'm not going to, I, I cannot underestimate this. And I Hello, to All right. Okay. Yeah. Hello. I don't All know. Right. Is this fine? Yeah, it's fine. Guys, is it fine for the rest of the class? Is it fine? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry for the inconvenience there. Um, like I said, I'm glad to be with you um here again. And and I I was glad at this time um you're having this revision at least three weeks to the exam, unlike the previous times when it was one week. You know, I found it difficult to maybe pass across the points that I feel because of the short time. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just basically speak on just three areas, um, given the um, three weeks you have to the exam, perhaps three areas that maybe you just need to look at, you know, just more like a recommendation and, and more importantly, what I did um, during my time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just um, talk around building your technical skills, um, noting the exam success skills, and then um, solving past questions. So those are the three areas. And then I, I, I would perhaps recommend some resources that might be helpful. Okay, so yeah, um, within the first of the three weeks I had to my exam, what I basically did was was revise um, the technical um, areas, you know, these eight subject areas um, that that we cover during the classes, you know, and and it helps because you you just want to have you know some knowledge of all the subject areas, you know, just just ensure that you try your best and and see where you can cover. I'm sure you're already having a revision and Jojo is already covering um, all of those areas. Um, just maybe look at look through your books again and and just be sure that you remember some things. At least you can be able to talk about something from each of them. You don't know where the question might come out from and and then um familiarizing yourself with the models um the models are there to serve as a guide um it's not like um it's um a requirement but what 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 it does is helps you structure your 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 answers well and and it helps you work work fast really so just just try as much as you can um, to learn as much models as possible but if you cannot learn or it's not it's not a problem but why it's important is that, that it's serving as a guide for you it helps you structure your answers well imagine when you are asked to talk about um external environments and you have pastel all you have to do is just explain the um what's it called each of the acronyms each of the letters in the acronyms yeah okay so um secondly um uh, exam success skills yeah these are basically areas where you just have to look at how you can do well in your exam boost your score manage your time you know plan your your answers you know um during my time i, I know you always recommended a particular model uh, which was the rule format mark allocation verb audience and professional skills the rfm vap model um it, it basically just helped guide my answers you know um i don't have to worry about where to start from or how to structure how to, how, how to structure my answer so it was it was a really important important um important guide, and then you also look at professional skills as well. You want to um, familiarize yourself with how to structure your answers in terms of um, the formats. You know where to use an introduction, where to use your conclusions, also how to answer questions. For instance, you have some questions asking you to evaluate. Yeah, for example, you, 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 have, you have talk about both sides, you know, of the arguments in such questions and then analyze as well, you know, back up your answers with figures and, 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 and draw interpretations from your, your, your calculations as well. And looking at extracting answers from your case studies, like I always say, most of your answer, a large chunk of your answer are in your case studies. And, and you just have to be smart about how you get your answers, you know. Jojo recommend that we annotate uh, then and it was it was really helpful you just have to be smart about that and knowing how to annotate you know um getting yourself familiar with it um, takes me to my third point you know and and and, and which is more around uh, um solving past questions but i'll i'll get to that and then in your exam success skills you so, so the basic things you already know in 
in most of your ACCA exams, um, uh, which is how much time you should allocate per score. You know, you basically um, look at the number of marks available and then the number of time you have for, for the exam. I think it's basically 1.8 minutes per, um, per point. So if I have a 10 mark question, for instance, um, I know that I'm timing myself for 18 minutes, right? And, and all of this, you, you won't get better at it if you don't start practicing your, your um, practicing to answer questions under time conditions. Yeah, so you just look at the time and know how, how much you should allocate to a particular question. And, and, and then uh, for the exam success cues, um, if you can, uh, I would also recommend that you get a study body. Um, it's really helpful because um, you, you don't know the areas where you could, you know, discuss so much on. And what study body helps with doing is that you guys discuss about the examinations, discuss about the eight subject areas. You hear each other's view, you learn new things. And it was really, really helpful. I, I had mine during my time. Um, I had um, prayer here, and, 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 and it was really helpful for me because um, we discussed about the areas of the exam, and it was more like a refresher. Whenever we have a chat, you know, it was really that helpful. So if you can, please, please do. You have so much time. In, in fact, I, I got my study for the one week to the exam, yeah, and, and we are talking about three weeks. So guys, if you can also. Yeah, so that takes me to my um, final point, which would be on solving past questions. <laughs> to me, this is the... If, if I really performed well in this exam, I think this was this was the key for me. This was the key for me. Um, solving past questions was really important. And not only are you solving past questions, but you are also solving them under time conditions. You have to just take the, um, the, the, the mock exams you are having as though they were an actual exam. So you just want to time yourself, you know, and, and make sure that at the end of the four hours you stop. You know, plan your, your timing well, your one hour preparation time, if that's what you feel would be okay for your three hours answer time. It's really important. Um, I had to mention that um, during my time, I, I, I remember solving all the past questions available as well as the specimen questions. And it was really helpful for me because it got me more and more familiar with the exam. And I did this within one week to the exam. And, and yeah, you have three weeks. So yeah, I know most of us are busy and all, but try as much as possible to, to, to solve these questions, you know, solve as much as you can. Because to be honest, when you sit in the exam that day, when you solve lots of these questions, it will look like one of the more questions that you are having, you know. It not only helps you with your time management, but it also helps build the mental strength that is required for this exam. You know, writing the four hours papers is not easy. And trust me, you need, you need that energy, you need that tenacity to keep going, you know, keep your, 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 your brain fresh and answering the questions. So, so solving past questions really helps. You know, all of these things I've mentioned, point one and point two, you can't really practice them when you've not solved mock, mock, mock exams, right? So when you solve mock exams, you know how to annotate, you know how to use the RUFM VAP um, structure I, I had mentioned, professional skills as well. You know, you have 20 marks available for professional skills. If you're looking to boost your score, you know, you have 20 marks available. Why not, why not take as much as possible from that? And, and these are skills that basically come down from, from, from your structure, you know, how you communicate, things like as little as putting an introduction and a conclusion, um, your memo, like, for instance, having to put from to subject date, you know, those little things. And then evaluating when you are told to do so, commercial acumen, you know, paying conscious attention to using savvy words, business words, as well. So these are really important um, when you are solving those mock exams and, and it helps you. Trust me, it really familiarizes you. I, I think about up to over 50% of my preparation was on these past questions. I, I can't emphasize that enough. You just have to try as much as you can. It, it helps you relax. Trust me, guys. And, and, and finally, um, just to recommend some resources that could be helpful for you. Um, if you can, um, take your time, read technical articles, you know. Um, I'm not, not trying to load you with so many things to look at, but maybe on an evening or when you are maybe less busy, just the way you take your phone and you look at social media, you can just pick up technical articles and just look at, you know. Yeah, it breaks down those maybe 
subject areas that may appear to be tough, you know, it uses simple common language that helps you understand them better. And then examiner's report as well. You want to learn from other students' past mistake. And, 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 and those are sort of things that you, you find on the examiner's report because it helps you learn so that you don't repeat the same questions. You don't, you don't repeat the same mistakes. I mean, so, um, so yeah, basically, you, you, when you look at those examiner's reports, you're also trying to get a sense of what the examiner um, requires of you. And then um, there's also an important document. I think Ope mentioned that communication, it's more around the document on communication style, how to write um, a memo, how to write a report, a briefing note, sliding notes, um, um, doing the slide with, with um, additional notes and, and, and stuff. Uh, I, I, I suppose Jojo shared it with us during our time. I'm not sure I still have it, but um, I'm sure Jojo will still have it. And maybe yeah, I'll, I'll speak on it. it. I'll yes, if you've not the importance exactly. of effective communication. Exactly. Yeah. So so yeah, so these are the few points I have for you. I I can't overemphasize more on that last point, which is around solving past questions. Guys, you have three weeks to go. It's really important. I, I mean this this was a key driver for me. So try as much as you can to lay your hands on question. You can share them with Jojo to look at them for you. You can even you can even mark it yourself. I mean, during my time, I didn't even um, bother maybe burdening Jojo with. Oh, I know he was he was very very busy, but you know, looking at the, um, looking at the examiner's answers, I, I could get what they want. Looking at the questions, the mark allocated, I could seek my answers. So yeah, just try as much as you can to solve past questions and get a study body discourse and look at these materials um, I suggested. So yeah, guys, um, those are um, all I, I I have to say. I wish you all the very best as you take these exams. Wow. Thanks. Um, to be honest, when you, when you guys talk like this, I wonder is my job not already completed, right? Uh, many many thanks um for that, and just listening to the time and the detail you went in explanation, um, so it's easy to understand why your score came out that way. So um, thanks. I, I guess the hands are already showing up for questions, so we won't spend time. We'll just jump in on the questions. Okay, so um, Ikena, the floor is yours. You can speak. Okay, thank you, Jojo. Um, I think I think what I want to say is basically a general comment. I think every all the speakers have emphasized this uh, thing about practice. Like everyone just tells you. Practice, practice, practice. There's no, there's no other way than practice. Yeah. So whether you're reading, if you don't practice, there's basically nothing that you're, you haven't really done the much, the bulk yeah. of what you have to do. Yeah. So I think I'll say thank you very much for that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ikena. All right. Do we have any question? In fact, the class just seems like ah, they've taken enough. But you guys need another break of 15 minutes to come back again. <laughs> Yes, please. Yes. All right. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, okay, so maybe I should just ask Moise one more question, then we'll take a break. I, I, th we've been back since um, 2 o'clock, so they might be tired, so that we come back again by 5 p.m. Um, so, Moise, tell me about time management on exam day. A question, please. Are we, right, go on. Is this the just for one? Is this revision only for one day? Today's class. Yes. 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 Okay. It's only for one day. Okay. So for the materials you said you'll be saying you'll be posting. Would you be posting it to the um the group? Because yeah, some sure, of sure. us are not. Sure, sure, sure. Time, Don't worry, not a problem. Uh, I'll even share my details. Don't worry, not a problem. Not a problem. I'll, I'll handle that. Thank not a problem. You. God bless you. Thank you. All right, not a problem. Doris, you want to ask a question? Yes, Jojo. Boris, right. thank you so much. I am uh, um, one of your admirers. I, I remember, I think, a uh, match diet when uh, you spoke, and uh, I was really telling, I was telling Joe that, ah, uh, that guy, I don't understand, but it's good. It's, it's okay. But I want to ask a simple question for people that have a very, very tight schedule. What is your advice? Because this practicing of a thing, I try as much as possible to practice, but before you know it, I'm dozing off in the night. Please, what is your advice? Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so so um, like me, um, I was I was in your shoes, you know. I had um, tight shoulders, and, and and then um, what I did, I don't know if you are able to do that. Um, let me just ask first: Are you able to get some days leave, you know, for this yeah. exam? Yeah. Is it possible? Are you able to get some days leave, Doris? Uh, no, I don't get leaves at all. There's oh. no leaves. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so you you might be um, really tired when you um, come back from work, uh, but I don't know how weekends work for you uh, because the mock exam you want to take it like an actual exam and trust me when you come back from work and you are taking the mock exam you are really tired and your performance will not be a good assessment of of, of your strengths yeah. right yeah so maybe during the weekend I, I think you have about two two or three weekends to go right yeah. during the weekend early in the morning it's best taking in the morning i i like taking mine in the morning when my head is still fresh you can can take the mock um, exam right i remember sometimes i took two in a day, and what I did was that in the morning I take the first one, I assess myself, and I take a break, take a nap, and then I come back. So I can come back, say three o'clock. So I can have the first one, say from eight to twelve, and then take a nap, rest, relax, and then come back, say three o'clock, and have another one, three to seven, and then I practically after after that I look at the answers and I and I mark myself. Yeah. So imagine doing that Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. Even if you're not able to take all, you are you you are able to take four or five. You you really can. You're going to see the results. Trust me. Okay. You see the results. You familiarize right. yourself with the questions. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um. Okay. I, I I guess one more call because I want to give you guys some break. To be honest, if we keep asking this question, some of you want to go on break. So okay. Let let just. I, I've got like three hands now. Okay. Let's go on. Let's go on. I, I, I'll still give us the break, no problem. If I go on. Hi, Luis, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm um, not sure what, um, what you said, but you mentioned something about RFM. I don't know okay. if that's what you What's so, RFM? Okay, I don't know if you just covered that. So I've not. not. So so yeah. the thing is, um, we started the session by three um, 3.45. So we're supposed to wrap up by 4.45. So I would cover those things. I, I'm going to speak on some of those things they were saying. Uh, I will tie them in. But I also want to say it to people who are quite fresh in the, right? So I'll give you guys a 15 minutes break. Maybe after we are done with the questions, then we'll come back and I'll cover the exam techniques. That will, that will help. Okay, um, that's fine. All right. Um, okay, so Emmanuel, you want to ask a question next? Hi Maurice, excuse me. Yeah. So I have a question here. I I get I get the fact that yeah, definitely I will have to um take the uh, mock test on that time condition. But my yeah. issue is marking. I think I spend more time marking my uh, script than the um test itself. So how many hours do you recommend I will spend marking it to understand? Because what I believe is there's no point doing plenty mock when I'm not learning from my mistakes of the mock. So exactly. I believe I should spend my time trying to understand things like what I did wrong, what I did right, the examiner's point of view, what I should have done better, my uh, my workflow, basically asking questions like what, what had this, like their point of view, if it's my point of view, how come they are seeing this, they are not seeing this. Thing? So basically I spend more time marking my script. So but yeah. definitely we don't have much time to do that. So what do you suggest I do in this scenario? Okay, I get your question. Uh, I mean, for me, whenever I mark my I, I, my script, I I tend to be more um to be detailed when I mark my script. And but at the end, I I spend around one 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 hour to one hour thirty minutes when I want to give in that much detail. I I think um within my first practices, I, I was spending that much time, but as time went on, um it reduced. But what I would say is that. Um, when you are marking, just compare. So you have the mark allocation, right? So for instance, when the question tells you to um, to maybe explain, for, for instance, say something around Potter's diamond, you get, and it's telling you eight marks, right? You have you have uh, you have two what's it called? Two points for 
each well explained point, right? So you're comparing the answers that you've given against the examiner's answers. So the examiner writes in more details, you know, the recommended answers are in more detail, right? In fact, more, more than double what is expected of you. So you won't really match them apple for apple, but it's just for you to get a sense of um, how well you have done, you know, if you get some certain keywords. And, and trust me, most of your answers can vary from the examiner's answers, but when you read the examiner's comments, you just get a sense of, sorry, the examiner's answer, you just get a sense of how well you've performed. So you shouldn't dwell too much on, 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 on that. What I'll just say is that try and learn from your mistakes and read the examiner's answers. And one thing that reading the examiner's answers does for you is that when you're taking the next one, you learn more, you learn how to structure your answers, you learn those business savvy words as well. So yeah, it should be more around you seeing how, what you've done and then within the examiner's comments. And um, trust me, one hour, one hour, 30 minutes is, is enough, right? Yes, yeah, so I, I hope that Thanks. helps. Yeah, they are All fantastic. Right. All right, so I've got Anike and Fumi. I really want us to manage time so that we go on a break. Anike, go on. Hello. Yeah, hello. Um, hi, Maurice. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you a quick question. So I have done an exam, but then I got 49. So I don't say I did the past questions. I admired and everything. Well, the past questions really helped me because they did. But then what else can you suggest for somebody that got like, like 49? Like what else? Because right now I'm not even motivated to do anything because I'm really upset. Uh, I can imagine. So sorry about that. You're really close. Um, this is a good opportunity to get this done and, and done with. Um, what I would also mention is that um, you should also continue with um, solving past questions. But I think you have an area you can also look at is trying to get as much marks as possible from the 20 professional marks available to you. Trust me. You, when you're able to gather those marks and 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 you answer the questions in the exam, you, 20 marks added to. So if you if you performed up to maybe a 40 out of the 80 of the other marks and you add the 20 or 15, you are you, you are over 50, right? For me, what I did with professional marks was even helped me score 90, right? Because that was what I was looking at. So not talk of when you are just looking at passing. So those professional marks, what are they asking for? Those are little things that. That, that 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 cover areas like using your introduction really well using your conclusion covering um so your memos so when you're asked to do memos you know putting those things as from to you know those two two one one marks you, those those marks are, are really really important when you're asked to do maybe briefing notes you know having your title well you get and then when you have to like maybe do a slide and accompanying notes you know Simply just drawing your bosses, putting your bullet points, and then explain your answers in your, in your company notes. Well, um, I, I think you should look at extracting more points from, from those um, available marks, those prints are available marks. Um, and if you're able to extract as much as possible from them, trust me, you won't be looking for too much from the, from the, um, from the standard score. So, yeah, I think you should exploit them. You should really exploit them. And you won't learn how to do that if you don't... Um, familiarize yourself more with the past questions. So in your past questions, as you are looking at answering the standard questions, ask yourself, how am I able to target those 20 professional marks? And those marks are available for you free. And, and it, just, it just covers those that I mentioned, you know. Evaluate, when you are told to evaluate, like I said earlier, looking at two sides to the coin, analyze yeah. when you put figures, gross profit margin, net profit margin. You're not just putting those figures. You're also asking, giving the examiner reasons why net profit margin has gone up. Are you saying that revenue has increased? Are you saying that cost has increased? Trust me, all of this information are in the case study. You would see them, right? So try to exploit those points. All right. Okay, so we've got just um, two minutes more before five. We, we must break by five so that um, we come back. We still have some things to cover up. And then we'll talk about next steps. So I know Fumi, your your hand is up. And, and I'll just like that you keep it very brief so that we get to this. So Fumi, go on. Okay. Yes, it's a very short one. Thank you very much. Just wanted to ask, I've been hearing on this practice, practice, practice. I'm using um BPP material and I have I think um five questions. I just wanted to find out where um the specimen exams where you can get more than 
five or like eight that um, we can have access to. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. I, I, they're on the SCA website, you know, just so even by simply googling, for instance, saying um, SBL December, June, sorry, December, September 2020, just google it. Uh, maybe the first portal you see there showing an SCA portal, or just click on it and you will see the past questions and their answers. So they're all available on the SCA website and the specimens. All right. All right. Thank uh, you. Uh, and in addition, I will speak on that. Okay, guys. Um, Maurice, many, many thanks. Many, many thanks for always showing up when we call you, even at the slightest instance. Many, many thanks. And um, you can see with the way the questions went, the excitement in just hearing your views. And you really made my job very easy. So many thanks for coming, and uh, I'm grateful for the experience you shared. So I, I think, guys, we can say a big thank you to him. You're welcome, Jojo. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you, Maurice. Oh, thank you, Maurice. Thanks. Thanks. Everyone, all the best, all the best. Thanks a lot. All, right. all the best, guys. Okay, so guys, let's take another 15 minutes break. Um, it's um 5 p.m. Is it what? It's five. It's <laughs> Don't worry, we'll be done. Let's take a 15 minutes break. Um, it's like 5 p.m. Nigerian time. Um, we'll be back by 5.15 in Nigerian time, so 4.15 GMT, and then we'll just cover the techniques and we'll wrap up. Um, because I think they've done a lot of the things I would have wanted to do. They've really highlighted the importance of some of the things, and then we get to work, which is really not getting to solving practice questions, right? And we'll talk about how we can look at past questions together. So let's see in 15 minutes time. Let, let's go on a break. See you guys in 15 minutes time. Thank you.
Hello, I can't hear anything. Is the class on already? We're on 15 minutes break. They're not back yet. Ah, okay. I thought we were meant to come back by 5 15. This is 5 27 already. All right, thank you. We are advised to come back at 5.30 from the chat. By 5.30, we'll be back. Oh, thank you.
हेलो हाय दे नो बैक येट दे नो बैक ऑल राइट थैंक यू वी आर बैक हु इज नो बैक वी आर बैक वेलकम we are back i i i just felt like you guys needed a lot okay. of break i felt like you needed a lot of break so that's why i said let's go on that break for 30 minutes so that whatever i'm saying i just felt you needed lots of break so if we are ready i'm ready we are ready we are ready we are ready all right, ready. All right. cool good good So let someone just type on the chat that we have started so that they know. Okay guys, um welcome back. So I I I think the guys we had on the call I I hope that was very motivational for a lot of us and we 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 took a lot of information from that. So let me tie it home so that we can custom and um I'll tell you, give you my parting shots, which I think will be very helpful. Then I'm, I'll stay back for any sort of questions. So, this is what I see with this exam and in my experience. So, on the exam day, I, I want to take you to the exam day. Then I will talk about what you need to do before the exam. But let me take you to the exam day. So, I think that essentially, I, I'm going to use a triangle to somewhat explain the things I see in terms of. an exam and you can stretch this to your approach even when you are solving a mock everyone has emphasized the relevance about a mock right so this is what i want you to do as you look through and as you go through sbl questions so i find out that there are three broad things that can shape your success in every sbl exam or attempt you make so i'm going to put them in a triangle and see that it's your ability to manage the three things right that would help you The first thing is time management. I speak to lots of students. I practically get calls across the entire world, right? On after an SBL exam, because I've got a, a varied amount of students that I, I I train on SBL. And one of the things that I hear a lot, right, is managing my time or not managing their time properly. So one of the things I want to make very clear, very clear in no mistaking order. is that if you are going to do well in this exam you must manage your time if you don't manage your time any other thing might be counted as some sort of gamble so I'll speak on time management so i want you to pay all, all of you pay attention to time management the second thing that i want all of you to pay attention to is this issue about and it was repeated in the questions you were asking the students so i call it the number of points you need to make what's the number of points you need to make what's the number of points you need to make in every exam right so because there's a temptation to write and write and write and write but you must be guided by the number of marks and that guides the number of points you make that's the second important thing i see and then the third important thing i also want to speak on which is related to this point issue is the length of your answer i mark a lot of mock and i see this the length of your answer right so the length of your answers or maybe i'll stretch that to say the length of the points that you are making so on the exam day i just want you to remember jojo speaking to you telling you you must manage these three things on exam day you must manage your time you must make sure you manage the number of points you are given for every question on the exam day and then the length of your response in the points so i'm going to break this three now we'll talk about it now So the very first one I will speak about now is time management. What is the reality? The reality is that your exam is for 4 hours. There's not going to be a deduction. If you would not do it for 4 hours, maybe it's an issue of going late. And I think there are protocols around even how late you can be to sit for the exam. So your exam at most will be for 4 hours. Right? So I might even give you for free say make sure you rest enough. Please rest enough. One of the guys spoke about resting at some point. Rest enough before that day. 4 hours might be a lot and especially because you'll be under a lot of exam pressure. So your exams are going to be for 4 hours. This is my recommendation for you. I want you to spend 1 hour on reading and planning your answer. 
spend one hour on reading and planning your answer. And I'm going to take you through some techniques you can do. Make sure you, you, you really break down. If you, you, you can get by with this exam somehow, you can somewhat cross the line. But I want to speak to someone who deliberately wants to pass this exam. One key thing is to plan your responses, plan your responses. And I have a framework for that, which I've been using since 2018. And there are a lot of testimonies with that, which I will speak to. And then the other three hours will now be for your response. I think, to be very candid with you, that a way to also prove discipline. I'm going to share this story with you. So the lady who I told you was my student, who was the best global student in December 2018, she actually said to me, that when one hour had passed, that she remember I said one hour, that when one hour had passed, she'd only, she had about two exhibits to go through. She stopped and started writing. So one thing I'm going to tell you guys is, let that discipline show through on exam day. If you don't manage your time, you cannot manufacture an extra time. You can't. Trust me, you can't manufacture an extra time. So be disciplined on time. So one hour for reading and planning, once you get to that point, you stop. You stop and you move on. So your timer must be with you. Your wristwatch must be with you. That guides you with the time. Once it is one hour, your exams will start locally in Nigeria here by 10 a.m., right? Once you start by 10 a.m., by 11, which is one after one hour after you start, you stop. Then you now move into responding. So this is where you now start generating and providing your answers. You start generating your answers. And I think that even with a CBA exam, I think it's even easier now. You start generating your answers. So... One of the things you can now do at this point now is to use the old time-tested rule, which is to say one mark will be equal to 1.8 minutes. And where is this coming from? These three hours for providing your responses is three by 60 is 180 minutes. So if you think about it, you are looking out for 100 marks over three hours. So technically one mark should be generated under 1.8 minutes. So this is how I want you to look at it. If you exceed the time, move on. Somebody spoke about breadth over depth. That's the truth. You are more likely to do well when you attempt all questions than when you focus on a few questions and you think you, you know it all. You are more likely. And don't forget, another trick is that for every question is embedded with a professional skill. So, assuming that you touch on all the questions, don't forget technically what are you doing. You're also touching on both professional and technical skills. So, if you deny yourself the opportunity to attempt all questions. Some of those free embedded points and marks, which speaks to the professional skills, you will lose out on them. So this is something I want you to take advantage of. So be disciplined on time. So my point to you is that if you will do well in this exam, you must be disciplined on time. I know I might say as much as I want to say, and the choice is yours on what you want to do, but I want you to take my word for what I'm saying. And it has been proven it has worked for people that the more you are disciplined on time, the more you will do well. What can help you is more mocks. As you do mocks, right, you heard all of them. Uh, Maurice didn't speak about his. Maurice finished all the available mocks, right? So as you do these things, right, it helps you. And you begin to find a recurring pattern in the way the questions are set. So my first charge to you is manage your time. And how do you allocate that time? One hour. Something I even say to students, which I'm happy to share with you, is that even these three hours, so Lewis, he worked for Lewis. He also worked for Morris. Morris didn't uh, say that part of his story. Is that you can actually make a deliberate effort to say that within these three hours, that two hours plus 45 minutes, that comes to something in the region of 165 minutes. You should be done. Then the remaining 15 minutes is to now review all your answers. And this is the point where you want to show you are dotting the T, the I's and, you know, crossing the T's. So link to this is that you're going to spend the one hour. So if you do this work, if you put a lot of time in this reading and planning, it becomes an easy thing for you when it gets to providing your responses. It becomes very easy. So I'm, I'm going to tell you what I say to my students at Ivy League. I'm going to share that with all of you. So I call this how to generate your answers, all right? Or planning your answers, call planning your answers. So I, 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 I teach them a framework and I'm happy to share that with you. We call it RFM VAP. 
So every question, you can break it down this way. And the good thing, I mean, I was marking some mocks internally at Ivy League. Um, and I, I think that was Banker's script. And I saw she was doing it. She was putting it there before every question, and I really liked it. You know, it even plays in the mind, in the psyche of the of the mark of your script, right? So I was seeing it before she will answer the question. She will state the role she's playing. She will state the format. So what does Al mean? Al is to understand your role. It's very important. I like to say you immerse yourself in the role. F is the format, right? So what is the required format? This feeds into the professional skill. Remember when I was talking in the earlier part of today. I did say that if you don't use the right format, you're going to lose mass. So you cannot even get all your professional skills. And that's why when Maurice was responding to someone, he said there are some available easy marks. So the use of your right report format, you don't you lose marks if you don't have it there. So by using it, there are some free marks that are available to you. If you check a typical. Let, let, let me show you, because sometimes when we say these things, let me show you something on professional skills hope i can find that document if not i'll send it to you oh professional skills marking guide okay i'll come back to it i'll drop it on group i just wanted to tell you how so just a second, I'm eager to make this point. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't know if you can see my screen, guys. Can you? Yes. All right. Yes. Cool. Let me show you guys something. No. Somebody saying no. All right. So I have the professional skills marking guide. Let me just show you something. Why you shouldn't joke with. Um, okay. Cool, 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 cool. Yes, so this is what I was looking for. So if you see the progression from what gives you from 0 to 0 0.5, you begin to see why it is relevant to use the right format. I just want to show you. So you just see the way we grade professional skills. You begin to see why as little as using the right report format would help you get some easy marks. So this is a document I want everyone to read. This is a document I want everyone to read on how the professional skills are highlighted. So as little as 0 0.5 marks are highlighted for just, okay, this is a point on evaluation. I'm looking for a reference to the format. Um, let this not waste my time. I will speak about it. Okay, don't worry, I'll, I'll get that document just highlighting the right use of formats and how that feeds into how that feeds into your marks. So one of the things I'll just say to all of you is that just use the right report format because the absence of that format, you lose some marks. So just have it in there using the right format. It helps you for a professional skill. There's a document that tells you how to prepare reports in the various report format style. Something again that I want you to do when you're planning your answers is also to pay attention to the number of marks. So at this stage here, right, this is the technical marks I'm referring to here. So pay attention to the number of marks. Now, what's the big picture with this? The big picture is 
if you know the number of marks assigned to a question, you can now determine the number of points you can make, which then leads to this thing I was saying. So this is how we grade in ACCA. One point gives you one mark. If you make a point, you get one mark. But if you develop the point further, which is what I'll say, state, explain, and add value, which is what is the point, you state it and you explain the point, and then why is that point relevant, which is to make sure, so one way to look at it is that that is a point that must be relevant to a particular question or a particular scenario within the question. So I say that if you come up with a point and you develop that point, so what is developing a point? That you state the point, you explain the point and show why that point is relevant to the scenario. So you can link that to say that the point is applicable to the scenario, right? Then that is a well-developed point. So maybe something like a question around financial performance analysis. You take a point, maybe your point is Jerry. You explain why gearing is important as part of the financial performance analysis. You are looking at the financial risk to ensure that the organization is not too leveraged. And with that, they are able to still attract some kind of finance, maybe from like a bank. Then you can link it to a particular point in the question where you can see maybe, for example, the gearing levels within the organization, making it very applicable to the scenario. That is a well-developed point. So a developed point in your exam will give you two marks. So this is the trick. If a question is worth 10 marks, perhaps as you practice lots of questions, you know how to develop your points. So you might say that in terms of well-developed points, if the marks are worth 10 marks, so in terms of the number of well-developed points, how many would you be looking at? Five. All right, so five points, obviously, right? So this is the trick, right? Um, the number of marks will guide you with the points. All I would just say to you is to divide by two. Now, dividing by two supposes, supposes, dividing the marks by two supposes that you are going to get all two marks. So if it's a 10 mark question, you just divide by two. And when you divide by two, you say, okay, I need to well develop five very good points. But what is the reality that I see sometimes? You might not be able to generate and develop five very good points. So what I now say to my students, which I'm happy to share with all of you on the call now, is to say, add an extra number of points because we will grade you up to the maximum number of marks you can get. There are no negative marking in ACCA. We grade you for up to the number of marks. So if a question is worth 12 marks, you take an approach of writing 12 points sparingly. That's also 12 marks. You might want to be very efficient, but the, it comes at the, uh, at the expense of time. You might want to say to yourself, okay, I go for six points, I develop the six points, and then six by two will give me 12 marks. Another approach, which is the approach I recommend, is to add some extra margins. So I would say go for eight points so that if you don't develop all the six points, at least if you develop eight points sufficiently, maybe you might attract one and a half marks. By the time you multiply one and a half marks by eight, what would that perhaps give you? It will give you something like what? What's that going to give you? To give Sorry, you a, I didn't, I didn't hear someone. What did someone say? 12, 12 marks. That's 12. Marks. Good. So this is my, that's my own approach. So what I would tell everyone on the call, I would just tell them that, you know what? Divide by two. And after you divide by two, add some extra margins in terms of the number of points you make. So if I go back now to this analogy, now let me ask you now that the total number of marks are 12 marks. So how many points do I want you to give me? Eight. Terrible. All right. <laughs> so eight, Terrible. exactly. Eight. Yeah. So divide by two and add two. So this is my golden rule. It works a lot. It works a lot. So I'll say divide by two plus two extra points. 
if you, if you adopt this approach, it will just help you. So that person who was asking, how do I know I'm not overwriting, I'm not overwriting, I would say to you, let the marks guide you. I've seen questions in SBL where the marks is six marks, and then I'm marking a mock, and somebody is writing two pages for me, and I'm wondering how inefficient can you get? Why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you wasting this time that could have been spent? And then a general examiner's comment, every diet, every diet, always repeated every diet, is that the quality of points tends to drop towards the end of the script because you find that you've burnt yourself in the earlier parts of today. So from Lewis to Morris and to the other guy who spoke, one of the things they did was they understood this principle that the marks should guide you in the number of points you make. If you do this, it becomes very easy. So a 12 mark question, don't give more than eight points. It's really not relevant. You're, you're, you're just wasting your time. For as long as you understand the concept of developing your points, then you're fine. And that's what the examiner will look out for. You heard Louis say he had about 25 minutes to the end of the script. It was because he knew the number of points he needed to generate. So that's something I'm going to say to you. Let the number of marks guide you. And that helps you with the number of points. So let me touch on something so that I don't waste time. But there's a trick again. So yes, you know the number of points. I've given you a guideline on the number of points, right? I've given you a guide on time management. Now, the other thing is, how lengthy should your points be? You know what I'll tell you from experience? Um, people used to have issues with handwriting. So, I, I mean, I've marked enough scripts to know this much. But now you're going to be typing. I think that a point should, at the maximum, not exceed four lines. My, my recommendation is between three to four lines. I, I struggle to see how you are going to develop and explain your points and you exceed four lines. You can't be making a point to me in six lines. What, I, what are you trying to really say? It's either you know it or you don't know it. So I think that you should keep... Is somebody talking? Are you trying to ask a question? I'm hearing some noise. If not, please go on mute. Yeah, so please come again, this um, development of points. I'm saying that you shouldn't spend more than four lines on, a, on developing your points. It's either you know what you're supposed to say or you don't. It should not exceed four lines. That, that's my take. It, it, you should not exceed more than four lines. So if you've got to generate eight points, eight by four, and, and something that I like again, in addition to this, is I call it paragraph spacing. So let me, let, let me show you what I mean. You make your points in paragraph. I, I, the examiner loves it a lot. I, and I as a person, right, if ever I mark a script and the and and candidate, you know, does that sort of approach for me, um, I love that a lot. Paragraphs, when you write, you give a paragraph between a point, you give a paragraph between a point, you give a paragraph. I love that a lot. We love it, right? We call it a, a well, a professionally written, you know, so let me show you what I mean. So, for example, so for example, we are speaking to something like the advantages of a two tier board structure. So, advantages of a two tier board structure for a particular organization, right? So, maybe I should make two points. So one advantage of having a two-tier board structure is supervision. Supervision of the operating board. So you generally have an operating board and then you have a supervisory board. So say supervision of board. I will say that a two-tier board structure The supervisory board can determine the efficiency and the effectiveness of the decisions that have been taken. And this will allow for a second level review of the decisions at Jojo Co. So something like this. I'm just giving a hypothetical comment, right?
you make your next point. So there's a bullet point, there's a spacing between the next point. There's a spacing between the next point. So I, I, I'll just tell you the point I was trying to make. For, forgive whatever I'm writing here. I just wanted to explain that this is just the kind of things we love to see, you know, when we mark. Well spaced, well spaced. You make a point, you space. Make a point, you space. You make a point, you space. You make a point, you space. This is the sort of things we like to see, you know, um, in the exam. So every point should be distinct, right? So a space. You make a point, you space. You make a point, you space. You make a point, you space. It really speaks to the psyche, right? Uh, and and you'll be able to get the best out of your marker. All right. Another thing I wanted to add to this is the verbs. So the verbs um, refer to the. No, 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 no. Sorry, I have a quick question, please. All right, cool. That's fine. Go on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Is there, um, just to, for clarification's sake. Okay? I want to be sure, like, I thought we we're not supposed to, like, number our answers or make um, bullet points. Like, we're just supposed to, like, put a small heading and um, write the answers under, then leave no. um, a space for under paragraph. No, not at all. Who said that? It's, it's just a function of the way the question is worded. No, there's nothing, nobody's, nobody has. So, for example, you, you can link that to professionalism. If you are writing a letter, do you want, so, I, I, there's no, no, I've never seen a report like that. You're not so you you can the, the point here was to so an alternative approach to what I did here could have been to use bullet points. There's no penalty on that. So maybe I could have used bullet uh, points. But I don't see anybody penalizing. I mean, what difference does it make? There's nothing wrong with this at all. Not at all. Um uh, I have a question. Yeah, please go. Okay, so when we did CB starting with uh, set now, you made mention of um, making, a, I mean, developing your point up to like maybe maximum of four lines. Now there yeah. is a computer base, you know, we don't have, a, there is no issue of um, big or small writing. Yeah. So um, what fonts are we supposed to use and what text um, type are we even supposed to use? Is it going to be programmed already or you have a little exactly. bit? Exactly, you can see it on the system here. Yeah, it's already embedded in it. So you didn't see me deciding whether it's aerial or whether it's this. Okay, so using the computer, using system now, how many lines do you suggest that we... we so, write? so, I mean, don't go... Maximum of four means don't go beyond four. If it stops at two or three, the, the examiner knows when you've made a point and when you've developed that point. So let me tell you another thing that will help you in this thing around developing a point. Apply your, make sure that your responses are applied to the scenario. Avoid theoretical response. If you can avoid, think about this developing a point as saying, make sure your point, let's look for a question. Let's look for a question. So I, I somewhat, you know, sort of uh, highlight what I'm trying to say. I'll look for a question. 
just make sure that any point you make speaks to the issues that the company is dealing with. That's all. Any point that you make. I think this question is around. Um, let me look for the question. Which question are we looking at? This is is this this is task one. Prepare a briefing notes that explains the specific nature of the principal agency relationship. A briefing note that explains the specific nature of the principal agency relationship and also the advantages of BCO having a two tier board. Well, the only thing is if I really wanted to do what you want me to do, I have to read the scenario for you to understand. So what I would just say is that these advantages now, right? In my response here, because I was only targeting showing you why you should distinct, make your points quite let them be distinct from each other. But the only thing I will tell you is that if you wanted to generate enough marks in your exam and get your two marks, every point that you have here has to be clearly an advantage that you can see in BCO. So I know this question on the top of my head, so I can tell you something about BCO. In BCO, there was a management board that was separate from a board of trustee. The board of trustee was like the supervisory board. While there was a management board that was in charge of the day-to-day -day management. So in terms of developing your points, means that that point is ex so, the point was on supervision. That was the point. Supervision was the point that one board will supervise the other board. Now you now explain it and tailor it to the organization is to now take it directly to BCO. And maybe, so, for example, the words like saying that in BCO, the management board will be supervised or the actions and the activities of the management board will be overseen and supervised by the board of trustees. This will ensure that there's a clear distinction in separation of duties. So the point is that it needed to specifically speak to the question. The question is the advantages for BCO. You know the two boards available, uh, uh, board of directors at BCO, and then you clearly know that the supervisory board, which is the board of trustees, have a duty to oversee. So by overseeing it, it improves the quality of decisions that will be made because the management board would always have their decisions vetted by the supervisory board. So once you are saying that, then you are speaking to the issues. Does this help? Does this help? I don't know if they can hear me. Does this help? It helps. Yes, I can hear you. All right. OK, sometimes I just yes, want to be sure yes, that you can hear me. You. All right, cool. So let's go back again. Now, another key thing I see is the verbs. So for every SBL question, there's always an action verb in the question. So let, let me take you to a particular question. And I want someone to tell me what the action verb. I, I, I call it the doing word. So some people, I mean, it's a very popular thing to hear a student tell me, I don't even know what to write. When I say question, what do I even write? How do I even start writing? So one of the things that this framework I do tells you is look out for the action words. So let's look at this question and I want someone to tell me what's the action word here. What are the key verbs to look out for? So look at it. Required, write a report on behalf of the sales and market. Write a report. Oh, let's go on mute. Let's go on mute, guys. Write a report on behalf of the sales and marketing director for presentation to the board which achieves both of the following. A, describes the benefits of introducing a customer database management system, including the loyalty scheme. Write a report on behalf of the sales and marketing director for presentation to the board, which achieves both of the following. A, to describe the benefits of introducing a customer database management system, including the loyalty scheme for smartware. So guys, who can tell me what's the action verb here? Describe. 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 
So what are you describing? You are describing what the benefits. Benefits. Of the introduction of a computer database management system. So if you understand the actual word, so those, that question I hear it a lot. What do I do? How do I start? I will tell you what's the actual word in the question. The word says you should describe what? The benefits. So in writing, what do you think the examiner wants to see? Who can tell me? What do you think the examiner wants to see in your response? The benefits. Exactly. The benefits. Exactly. A clear description of the benefits. And this is a six marks question. So if you apply it the way I've told you, right? So you can divide this by two, you get three points. You can add one or two. It's a six marks question. Don't stress yourself. You don't write and say, ah, I know about customer database. I want to write one page. I want to write, no, no, no. Four good points can take you home. But, sorry. Sorry, Jojo, yeah. but the thing is, you still need to make reference to the um, scenario. So that's another thing. You saying that or writing that on top of your head, you still make need to make reference to the scenario given. All right, that that's fine. Uh, how does that differ? Uh, how does that differ from what I'm saying? I just want to know, so I, I know your question really. So yes, that's it. So okay. how is that different from what I'm saying? No, so I help you okay, bring it so up. What? I, I want to get your point. Yes. Okay, so my understanding from what you are saying is, if you know the benefits of the um, CBM, you know, like you know it on top of your head from notes without making reference to the scenario, will that fetch you, Mac? No, 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 no. Guys, is that what you understood for me? No, that's not what I'm saying. I was speaking okay. to the comments around somebody saying, I don't even know what to write. So I was saying that, what should you write? You should be describing the benefits of introducing a customer database management system, including the loyalty scheme for smartware. So we will go through the scenario. And you see, you know, the thing with um, SCCA questions is that we read the questions before we start reading through the scenario. So a good student already knows that there's a particular question that asks is for a description of the benefits of introducing the customer database management system and the loyalty scheme. So what should you look out for? As you read the scenario, you might be given some insights into an introduction of a customer database management system. Maybe perhaps, and look at it here, right? So. You